moment of triumph. Look. It's gone. The picture is gone. can't get away from Spider-Man. No matter how hard I try, I think I'm just permanently associated with the character because I got my start, more or less, by reviewing all of his video games. Then I made the foolish mistake of sewing his costume together myself and taught an entire generation of teenage boys how to make clothes, a useful skill for the coming near apocalypse of 09. And then I explained why I thought Miles was better written in Spider-Verse than in the comics, and that got 1.4 million views. It's gotten so bad that when I open commissions to make cosplay props for people, despite explicitly saying I won't do web shooters, I got nothing but requests for those. I was in talks with another YouTuber to do a collaboration and he said, well I don't really do Spider-Man videos on my channel so I don't know what we can work on together, despite the dozens and dozens of videos I've made about other things. So I kind of swore it off for a while just to save myself some stress. Until I checked Patreon one day and someone donated the $100 tier for a video request. But not only did he give $100, he gave $500. Jonathan Stubbs is an insane madman with too much expendable income and a burning, passionate desire to hear me talk about these cartoons. Very few people have ever been that generous to little old me before, and I feel like I owe it to the guy to at least try, despite my newfound arachnophobia. Maybe it'll be fun to reminisce and talk about the old web slinger again. Perhaps looking at these shows with a new perspective and future context will reveal something interesting about them that hasn't been talked about yet. And maybe I'll finally collapse on my desk editing videos because I finally built up a tolerance to caffeine and my neural electroshock crown shorted out. If there's something you desperately want to hear me talk about, you can donate to the $100 tier on my Patreon to request a review just for you. But even a $1 donation helps me immensely. If just 3% of my subscribers donated only a dollar a month, I wouldn't need a side job to make ends meet and I could devote a lot more time to making videos and paying editors to help me get other ones out too. Please consider helping a brother out. Now on to tonight's main presentation. Being the overnight sensation that saved the Amazing Fantasy comic line and launched a new era for the Marvel Comics empire, Spider-Man quickly became a hot property in the early 1960s and hasn't lost that momentum since. With such a colorful and dynamic design, such broad and appealing stories, and such a unique characterization, people couldn't get enough of the webhead. It only seemed logical to broaden his appeal outside of the comics with some of Marvel's first ever licensed merchandise, and eventually... Aww. So with that, let's take it back to the swinging 60s and talk about that goofy bullshit everyone's made a million memes over and doesn't take seriously. A show that's often looked past because of its reputation of just being cheesy garbage with animation errors galore, absurdist logical paradoxes, and an ever-changing visual style that's so much fun to plaster with the impact font. However, it's actually kind of good. Well, okay, hear me out. Good is a relative term in this case. Convince me! As stated, this show's got a lot of problems. More problems than you can shake a web at. How the fuck? But there's a few episodes throughout it that are really solid for the time. I've often heard people miscredit the 90s animated show as the first superhero cartoon to adapt stories from the comics, but the show is riddled with really accurate recreations of classic Stan Lee and Steve Ditko stories, sometimes right down to the dialogue being used word for word. Granted, it's not always as pretty to look at as Steve's legendary penciling, but occasionally the show tries to get really accurate and just flat out traces his art into animation cells to bring it to life. I can't tell if that's cool or a little legally dubious, but the part that attracts me to this show's better episodes is that I feel like the people behind it, for better or for worse, understood Spider-Man as a character. He's a badass superhero that feels it's his personal responsibility to save the day, even though that heroism costs him in his personal and social life. Spider-Man is a genius, confident, wisecracking hero with the strength to rival most Avengers, 
But when he takes off the mask, he's a guy who can't catch a break and always feels like he's getting the short end of the stick. Somehow this series against all odds captures that essence in its own universe pretty well. Let's take the first episode, for example. It's a little weird that Peter is driving a car, but he gets into a bit of an accident on the outskirts of the city while on assignment for the Bugle. In trying to salvage his ride, he accidentally uncovers Doc Ock's secret lair where he's setting up a plan to create a man-made underground shockwave that will demolish New York with earthquakes. And his dialogue is pretty on point. My plan is deceptively simple, just like you. Spider-Man! How did you get out of those handcuffs? Just talented, I guess. And to further cement our friendship. <laughs> Like, these are good quips, man. That's how Spider-Man talks. J. Jonah Jameson is pulled straight from the comics. Doc Ock feels like he was written by Stan Lee himself. Spider-Man's voice actor, the great Paul Souls, even makes his voice sound softer and weaker as Peter Parker, but manly and confident as Spider-Man. I don't know what this is all about, but I'm gonna get some pictures for old J. Jonah Jameson. And there in the frozen wastelands, your friendly Spider-Man spots his... Uh, whatever it is. You may be put off by the lighthearted and comical tone, but Spider-Man is an incredibly versatile character when it comes to tone. There are just as many silly stories for the character as there are dark and gritty ones, and yet both seem to work for him when handled properly by the right people. As it turns out, Lee, Ditko, and even John Romita Sr. all had a bit of a hand in the character design in this first season, and story consulting. I was really blown away by this first episode because I wasn't expecting this to be as competent as it is. But then reality sets in and then you remember this has 22 minute episodes and that the first daring adventure only lasted a prompt 10 minutes and 51 seconds. Then the second half plays as Spider-Man takes on the famed villain, Ice Aliens from Pluto. Okay, this is where I think the criticisms are mostly founded. This show has two types of episodes. Really cool adventures with comic villains and some pretty snappy writing, and really bizarre stuff where they tried to create their own villains for him to fight to save on the budget, often filled with really nonsensical stories and clunky animation. Never count your chickens before they're hot. But even then, they get the basics right. Spidey's still a science whiz, he's still clever and smack talks the bad guys, and he still gets shafted as Peter Parker by his exploits so I can't hate on it too much. I understand the necessity to create a new antagonist when you've got a weekly show and need to produce 52 episodes to play in syndication. By this point in history, Spidey was still only around for less than five years and didn't have this infinite well of characters and stories to pull from. But the demand for more of this runaway success of a character was huge. They only had a handful of source material to use, and it looks like they tried their best to pull as much from it as possible. I wouldn't count on that, Mysterio. I am fucking crazy! I really like this effect from Mysterio's helmet, and I kind of want to see that done with like a newer setting and smoother animation. Unfortunately though, this show had a shoestring budget and couldn't afford to keep buying character rights as it went on, and season two and three are pretty devoid of new comic villains. That's probably what holds this show back from being beloved in an unironic sense. The extreme lack of budget. These will make short work of you! You fool! If you destroy us all! I can't get my hands on any concrete numbers, but it's kind of well known that, like, you know, they just look at it. Now let's not discount animation at the time and say this was like the best you could do. With the right money behind a project, you could get like Disney quality or the godlike Fleischer Superman cartoons. With smooth, fluid movement and detailed character shading. That shit came out in 1941 and I think it looks better than most stuff being made now. 60s Spider-Man is unfortunately bogged down by the fact that the production company, Grand Trey Lawrence Animation wanted to throw no money at it, meaning the end result looks like classic He-Man or that god-awful Star Trek cartoon. And you don't want to hear all these excuses and this positivity, you want to hear me complain and mock this thing because outrage sells. Alright, <clears throat> it's bitching time. Spider-Man building complex structures out of webbing is stupid and makes zero sense, and there's a shocking amount of convenient construction equipment laying around for him to drive. How the fuck do you color his costume this wrong? There's so few drawings made for this show overall that they reuse animations constantly. 
Which means animation errors are almost constant too, like his logo having the incorrect amount of legs, webs don't attach to anything like an unfortunate amount of video games. In fact, there are whole episodes that are reused animations. Characters are often stiff as hell. Spider-Man is off-model in pretty much every shot. What does that mean, you may ask? Typically, animated shows will have a character model sheet to draw their different poses from for consistency's sake. The lack of consistency in Peter Parker and Spidey makes me wonder if they even had a model sheet because his eyes, logos, webs, and face change as frequently as the perspective cuts to a new angle. And don't even get me started on the sound mixing. Come on up, With that Electro! I can't hear you, the music is really loud, what are you saying? I almost wonder what this show would feel like with more modern sound mixing. Let's test that. There's a billion dollar price tag on this Spider-Man. Well, that was fucking weird. Yeah, the show definitely has its flaws, and I'd say a lot of its reputation is founded. But I feel like people don't often give it enough props for the episodes that it got right because they're classic, unfettered Spider-Man. I'll just have to prove Spider-Man's innocence another way. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I'd better do it as Spider-Man. Yes, Uncle Ben is dead, and in a sense, it's really I who killed him. Because I didn't realize in time that with great power, there must also always be great responsibility. But I know it now. And so long as I live, Spider-Man will never shirk his duty again. Robbers, killers, beware. Spider-Man is here. This show probably had the most accurate recreation of Amazing Fantasy 15 ever adapted to screen. So sure, while it has its quirks and fair share of weirdness, it's not entirely terrible and if you ignore some of those weirder parts, I think it's actually worth a watch for fans of the character. <coughs> <laughs> oh god, I have it. Well, I want to take this retrospective a little slower, and instead of cramming four reviews into a single video, really give each show room to breathe. Plus, it takes a long time to watch an entire TV show front to back, so be patient. Tune in next time for the continuation, where Spidey can finally afford extra puff paint, and he has a few above-average bros to tag along and help. Looks like the killer gutted the victim, strangled him with his own intestines, and then dumped the body in the river. We're dealing with one sick son of a bitch. You wanted me home to see a TV cartoon show? Finally back to Spider-Man Cartoons Retrospective Part 2. Hopefully you guys don't mind the wait, but you know, it's only been- WAIT! SEVEN MONTHS?! Oh shit! Well, I've kind of put off doing this video because of all the Spider-Man cartoons out there, these two are the ones that I had the least to say about. They're not shows I'm particularly passionate about due to any emotional connection with them, nor are they misunderstood little time capsules like the 60s series that I'd show in a new light. They're both exactly what you think they are at first glance. A Spider-Man show and... Gee, we need to sell more action figures! Let's give him some sidekicks! I will say it's a little interesting and strange to me how the 1981 show is often very looked over by fans of the character. It's not quite the infamous meme machine of the turbulent decade, swathed in laughable decisions and lovably absurd animation, and it's not quite the nostalgic journey through your childhood that millennials tend to attribute to Two Guys, One Firestar, or The Punchless Wonder over here. Fun fact, that's probably the only joke I'm gonna make about that because I feel like it's the most tired talking point ever and there's so much more to talk about with this series than just the censorship. See, there I go! I'm more interested in talking about that guy than these guys! I still feel as though it's tradition to at least try to do a full episode on a particular subject, so I'll still give an honest attempt at looking back at these two unloved middle children of the televised Dead Uncle broadcasts. So, 80s Spider-Man. Um... They had enough money to draw the webs this time. I jest, but I actually really dig the look of this show. It's pretty clearly inspired by John Romita Jr.'s artwork from the 80s and reminds me a lot of his comics from that time. 
Back in the good old days when every artist was instructed to keep it all on model and every Spidey comic looked like Ramita Sr. So it wasn't distracting when the book changed art teams. In a weird way, I kind of like how consistent things were in those days. Before Tom Todd McFarlane came in and said, Just draw whatever, give him 10 million webs and put his thighs behind his head, everyone go nuts! So this show's visual style feels like a sign of the times, and I appreciate these character designs. They're simple enough to animate, but more accurate than the series' predecessor. And speaking of accuracy, this show has a pretty strong grasp on its title character that should be given more praise. Spider-Man stays out all night fighting crime, but then falls asleep and forgets to do his homework. That's on brand, I dig it. Spidey has to ditch his date early to go catch a villain and then gets dumped in the most embarrassing way possible. Uh, JJ, what do you say you and I have a night on the town? Uh, sure, why not? Don't work too hard, Parker! Who says the good guy always gets the girl? Yeah, that tracks. He forgets to lock the door on his closet and has to figure out a way to explain the Spider-Man costume in there to his Aunt May. Nailed it. I like how this show captures those little human conflicts that go on in his day-to-day -day life. Those silly little things that ground him and make him more relatable than your average costumed crusader. I can tell you Batman doesn't give two shits what his date thinks. He's more interested in all the sexual tension he's got going on with that rambunctious Skywalker juggalo. Iron Man doesn't do homework, he just drinks and f**ks and then causes one more day to happen. You ever seen Captain America have to go to the DMV to get his plates renewed? No siree! But anyway, every episode has a nice little example of Peter's home life and his superhero life being at odds. And one of the dramatic strengths of the character is how when Peter Parker succeeds, typically Spider-Man loses, and vice versa. This cartoon has a better grasp on this character than 95% of his Twitter fandom who keep arguing about whether or not he's a pessimist or an optimist, or whether he wants Iron Man to be his dad or he wants to punch him. Here's one of my favorite moments from the show where it just felt like pure, unadulterated Spider-Man brought to life. Well, 2D life drawn on cells. And the Sandman accidentally tears off Spidey's mask in a fight and he has to scramble away like a punk to figure out how to conceal his face again before going after him. This is a cool setup, and I gotta give props to the animators for working in a scenario where Peter's face is visible during an action scene. It's probably not as cheap or easy to animate his facial expressions during a fast and energetic scene like this, but they went the extra mile that the 60s show wouldn't have touched with a 10-foot pole, which would have been poorly inserted into one of the six pre-rendered shots that you've seen five or six times already in the last 22 minutes. Then there's some great moments with J. Jonah Jameson bantering back and forth with the trapped Spidey. Hey, neighbor. I, uh, wonder if you could spare a helping hand? You don't fool me, you web-slinger! Whatever you're up to, I'm gonna get it on film! Oh, great! You can pass out snapshots at my funeral! And a cool ending where our hero uses both personas to get a personal victory for himself. There's plenty of cool episodes in this show that feel very worthy of the character. If you can stomach a few that shove in some villains that were just popular at the time. Both Magneto and Doctor Doom appear in this show with Doom having a very disproportionate amount of screen time for whatever reason. In fact, I think Doom is the main villain in the intro. He appears more times in that opening credits than even Green Goblin, damn. There are four different episodes with him as the main villain, while Vulture, Goblin, Sandman, Lizard, Chameleon, and Kraven all just get one. The villain roster is also padded out with a few original characters, too. I understood why that happened in the 60s cartoon, but at this point, there had been 20 years worth of new villains to choose from, so there wasn't really much of an excuse to not use them. However, something kind of cool about this show is that not every episode has an origin for their villains. And this show implies that Spidey's been around for a while and seems to know who some of these chumps are. And unlike the 60s cartoon, this one definitely had a better grasp of how to use Green Goblin. It adapts a classic Spidey story with Norman Osborn recovering from amnesia and remembering Spidey's identity after a battle a few years ago caused him to forget. Perfect. <laughs> Just in time to find Spider-Man without his mask. And think what the shock will do to your dear old Aunt May! <laughs> That's even Neil Ross, the same Green Goblin voice actor from the 90s show. But what of Spidey's trademark girl problems? Who does he pine for in this show? Well, Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane aren't here, but Betty Brant is? Uh, okay. And much like the 60s cartoon, I wish that wasn't the case. Betty just gets angry at him constantly, complains, and says he's a shitty boyfriend, but then keeps going out with him anyway. 
that the guy was such a flake then stop messing with him and get with a real man like Flash Thompson. He's Venom sometimes. But then Peter comes to his senses and decides to get with someone who understands him. M Medusa from the Inhumans. I'm not joking, that's how the show ends. He saves Medusa from being controlled by a villain, and then they hook up. Love? Hey, who would I be in love with? Not the redhead you were expecting, but I'll, I'll take it. When this series goes for direct Spidey stories, it does a pretty solid job of adapting them and really captures the zany cheesiness of his comics from that time. As well as how in those stories, Spidey and his villains usually take this goofy stuff deadly serious. And even when it's trying to tell an original story, it does an okay job of making that fit the tone and themes of Spider-Man anyway. And even sometimes has some superhero crossovers, which were a new thing in superhero cartoons at the time. It has a bit of a problem prioritizing which villains to use, but it has a decent take on all the classics. I like this one a lot. I'd say this is the first really great attempt at a Spidey cartoon after the 60s show started to lose the plot a little due to budgetary concerns. If you like good old John Spider-Man and his chaotic day-to-day -day life, check it out. But you could come with me. This is where I belong. Then, farewell. You'll never escape again, murderer! I'm down to my last spiny suit. Murder! Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Have you ever wanted a show where Spider-Man replicates what was most popular in that era of cartoons? Groups of hip young platonic teens going on adventures with a silly cartoon dog sidekick. Well, if you did, then look what you did, you monster! In fact, Iceman looks and sounds just like Fred Jones. I don't believe this! Ms. Lion! Though the dog might be more of an attempt to ape off of Super Friends. In this show, Spidey teams up with his GBF and will-they-won't-they they gal pal, Coriander of Tamarind. The three of them have powers based on the four elements. Fire, ice, and spiders. You're gonna get a big charge out of this! Of all the people in the Marvel Universe to saddle Spidey with as permanent sidekicks, I feel like Iceman was a really random choice. And then making an original character was even more confusing. Apparently they couldn't get the Human Torch due to some licensing issues, which is why he was replaced with a dumbass robot in that other cartoon. So Angelica Jones was created and looks way too much like Mary Jane. The three of them sleep in the same bedroom in Aunt May's house, which she's now renting out as a polyamory friendly bed and breakfast. I appreciate how Fireman and Ice Star aren't super intrusive. This still feels like a Spider-Man show through and through. They aren't posited as Spidey's equals and shoved into his spotlight. They know their place. Title should have been Spider-Man and his subservient bottoms. So I bet you're wondering, this looks a lot like the 1981 series. Is this a sequel to that? Well, that's kind of confusing and hard to answer, especially considering both shows started airing on the same day. Spider-Man was popular back then, I guess. Whatever turns you on, turns me on too, Spidey darling. So, uh, Spider-Man's voice is different. Now he's voiced by original Bumblebee voice actor Dan Gilvezen. You whippersnappers may also recognize him as Spider-Man 2099 in Shattered Dimensions. Well, sometimes it seems like the shows are connected. Spider-Friends has a flashback to the Magneto episode of the 80s cartoon, but both of them portray Green Goblin very differently with one going the split personality costume change route, and the other making it seem like he's not wearing a costume, he just actually physically turns green and crazy. Both shows cover the origin in different ways. There's also a lot of continuity errors with what's going on with Red Skull and Doom. So, my prognosis is no, these shows are not connected. They just share some footage in one spot where it could save them some money. And, you know, use similar music and character designs. But outside of that, they are happening in different timelines. And that really shows in the tone of both shows. A swim is just what I need to revive my strength. Ah! That's not water, it's alcohol! This show is the true spiritual successor to the 60s cartoon, in that it recreates the signature style of having two episode types. Decent adaptations of comic storylines, and bizarre batshit insane buffoonery where Spider-Man feels out of place because everything around him is so strange. 
Like an episode where they adapt the first appearance of Green Goblin. You know, that weird storyline where he tricks Spider-Man into starring in a fake movie about himself for money as a trap, then tries to murder him, then the Hulk randomly shows up because they were in the cave he was staying in at the time. Except the show did that better because they swapped out Goblin with Mysterio, who is a villain already associated with deception in Hollywood, so it works way better. Good on ya, you retroactively fixed a really stupid story that even Deadpool thought was a weird intro for Spidey's nemesis. Then there's the other type of episodes. Wherever on his bugs and Spidey has bug eyes over his costume bug eyes, and in an episode where he dates an alien girl, and in an episode where Electro traps Flash Thompson in a video game, and in an episode where Iceman comes out to his parents, and in an episode where Firestar marries Dracula. More often than not, in both types of episodes, the villain is always watching our heroes and torturing them from a control room full of monitors. I like to think in the Marvel Universe, there's some company out there selling supercomputers and various monitors whose sole customer base is supervillains trying to kill the spider friends. You can tell which episodes I'm more of a fan of. The weird random stuff doesn't do it for me, but there are a handful of original episode storylines that aren't terrible and feel a bit more grounded. Wait! I... No! See you back at the gym! Boy, that student really rigged up the wires. Wires? And even if not every episode hits for me, I do like the look of this show a lot. Same cool character designs, but occasionally with some pretty detailed shading, and it even slips into like an 80s anime style. I suspect because a few portions were animated by different studios or had considerably more money. If I were to pick some episodes that were worth checking out, I'd say the origin ones are all good, but then the X-Men crossover is pretty cool and I really wore out the VHS tape I had of it as a kid. It's not the best Spidey series, but it's still got some merit. Spidey's the same hero we know and love, and it's not so bad having a few friends to tag along since they make sure the spotlight stays on him. It's clear this show did resonate with some people though, because it's always being referenced in one form or another in the comics, and Firestar managed to carry over to the books eventually. It's still got that same Spider-Man charm, just with backup this time. I'm ready to chuck it all and give up being Spider-Man. Peter? No way, buddy boy. What happened to that great lesson you learned? Yes, with great power... ...comes great responsibility. Go for it! Okay, I'm going to do the, ne the next one. Um, if that takes a couple months, please don't be angry at me. I, I will be soon. It won't take seven months, probably, but, but like, just be patient, okay? Be patient. I got stuff to do. Be patient. To set the stage, the year is 1990-something. Spider-Man hasn't had a substantial cartoon on the network in quite a while. Marvel is facing bankruptcy from some bad investments and sketchy business decisions. They begin selling off their rights to various movie studios, and Hollywood giant James Cameron was interested in adapting Spider-Man to the big screen with a movie featuring Electro, Sandman, and a lot of awkward outdoor public sex scenes with Mary Jane. Uh, Spidey says the F word. To coincide with the upcoming movie that we now know never came to pass, Fox Kids was tasked with bringing Spider-Man to television in a brand new way that broke the mold with possible connections to the already immensely popular X-Men series that had just launched shortly before. Put yourself in the shoes of screenwriter and animation producer John Semper Jr., the man behind the water slaughter. He's got a fair amount of experience creating and running animated television shows, he's a massive Spider-Man fan, he knows the character inside and out, and he's already established a friendship with the one and only co-creator of Spider-Man, Stan Lee. Naturally, he seems like the perfect choice for... Well, actually, he was the second choice after the first showrunner got fired. Well, that was lucky, because Semper came onto the series wanting to do something that had never been done before with Spider-Man. And did he succeed? Oh, definitely. Spider-Man the Animated Series brought Spider-Man to life by combining depthful, operatic character drama, multi-part, complex, serialized story arcs, faithful and appreciative adaptations of the source material, and, of course, Morbius' scary plasma sucker hands. Ugh. This is easily one of my favorite animated shows of all time. Let's dive deep and talk about why. From the look of the series reimagining Spider-Man's mythos with more 90s appropriate redesigns of the main cast, 
to featuring recent characters like Carnage, Venom, and Hobgoblin, to the show's blend of CGI and cell animation, Spider-Man the Animated Series is very obviously a product of its time. The comics of that era were all turned around about clones, so many looked to this show as the new way to get their fix for serialized Spidey story arcs. Whenever I think of this show, I'm always reminded of the color palette and visuals of the scenes at night. This Spidey just looks wrong during the daytime somehow. All of the most important scenes took place in the darkened New York skyline, highlighted by bright yellow windows on the skyscrapers surrounding them, bad guys with giant toyetic armor and machines bearing down on Spider-Man with laser rifles in hand. There's just nothing quite like it, so this show's look is very special to me. But on top of that, it goes for a really strong sense of realism to the designs. Everything is mechanical and detailed and designed with intended purpose and function. This was a nice contrast to the heavy, stylized approach from the Warner Brothers Batman series at the time, with a more gothic, noir look. And, you know, it translated well to toys. Spider-Man the Animated Series also dabbled in 3D animation to give us some really dynamic, sweeping backgrounds and crazy, shifting perspectives for Spider-Man's swinging scenes that just couldn't be obtained with static, painted backgrounds. It may look dated by today's standards, but they were pioneering a mixed-media method that's incredibly common in modern cartoons. Almost to a detriment because no one wants to draw cars anymore, they're all 3D models! This outside-the-box approach to the visuals for the action was really creative and unique back then. The characters themselves all have a look that's very distinct and easily associated with this show. Like Peter Parker's 70s haircut that Stan Lee insisted was more hip and modern than the early concept art even though it was the 90s. Or how everyone had those charmingly high-waisted denim jeans. When I got there, they they uh, had designed Peter to look pretty much the way that he looked in the uh, the Johnny Romita comic books. We drew Peter. We initially had Peter looking exactly as he looked in those comic books. Bob Richardson sent me this picture. He, he, he I think he faxed it to me, and he said, "This is what Peter looks like now." <laughs> when I first saw it, I didn't like it because it wasn't the Peter Parker that I had grown up with. It was Stan. You know, one day Stan just woke up on the wrong side of the bed, I guess would be the best expression. And he just decided that this Peter Parker that we had been working with looked old fashioned and he wanted something that looked, you know, younger and hipper or his idea of what younger and hipper looked like. <laughs> I also love that this Peter Parker is the most jacked, buff, bulky, manly slab of hunk you've ever seen. And people still don't really think he might be a superhero. Maybe the haircut was distracting from his 24 inch biceps like Clark Kent glasses. While the X-Men broke ground by having every episode bleed into the next or show remnants of those before it, Spider-Man took it a step further by finding the unique middle ground of self-contained story arcs that span multiple episodes. John Semper knew that James Cameron's theatrical Spidey was in the works, even though it eventually deservedly crashed and burned, and decided to counter that by treating the story of Spider-Man like a series of movies broken up in half-hour segments. Some long, some short, sometimes the story wrapped up within 30 minutes too. It all depended on what was appropriate for the story they wanted to tell. It almost feels like hopping back and forth between Spidey's ongoings at the time, like Web of Spider-Man, Spectacular, and Amazing. Season 1 consisted mostly of one-offs to get the characters and setting established, and had a fair amount of influence from official Marvel writers such as Gary Conway, Marv Wolfman, and Stan Lee himself making adjustments to the scripts. After long enough, the majority of the writing duties fell to John Semper himself, with a handful of writers backing him up following his guidelines for the plot. Though pretty much all of the scripts were written or heavily rewritten by him. I like to think of it as this show is pretty much his own sort of Spidey comic run, because very rarely does a show of this length have pretty much one major creative voice behind the writing for that long uninterrupted. And many of Semper's ideas for the show ended up becoming so heavily associated with Spidey that they're often falsely attributed to being part of the comic history. Either that or his influence impacted pretty much all adaptations of Spider-Man going forward because he did such a magnificent job of remixing, simplifying, or tying ideas together from the comics to make them feel like one coherent creative voice instead of a rotating team of writers across many decades. Many of the creative choices in Spider-Man TAS that differentiate it from other Spidey takes from before it have become really common ideas being used even to this day like giving Dr. Octavius a role inspiring Peter's love of science and being a teacher slash mentor for him before becoming a villain. Their laughter is meaningless. Science is the important thing. 
It justifies all that we do in its service. In the books, they had no prior relationship or knowledge of each other, but that little change makes Otto a slightly more tragic villain. There's also the change to the Venom symbiote. In this series, it turns Peter into an aggressive, violent monster that nearly kills someone until he has to force it off himself. This change carried on into the Ultimate comics, the movies, a few of the games, and even the later cartoons. But originally, the symbiote didn't affect Spider-Man's behavior at all. It started making him exhausted every morning, but his personality remained the same. It just kept taking his body for joy rides while he was asleep at night because it just liked jumping around, pumping adrenaline, fighting crime, and kissing Black Cat. That change to turn the symbiote more villainous made sense for why Eddie Brock would become such a psycho when he first bonded with it, and also make Peter seem like less of a jerk for ditching the suit so quickly without fully understanding it. We also have Dr. Connors being a science teacher at Peter's college for the first time, which carried on into the movies, other cartoons, games, and eventually the mainline comics. Mary Jane being the first major love interest was a new idea, and the scene of Goblin taking her up onto the bridge to throw her off made it into the Sam Raimi films and the Brian Michael Bendis comics. They eventually introduced Madame Web in the series, who, in this continuity, isn't just clairvoyant. She has interdimensional powers that can warp reality and see through time and space, which she uses to assemble a squad of Spider-Men from various realities to save the day across the multiverse a plot reused later in Shattered Dimensions. Hell, this show might even be the reason why everyone thought the Hobgoblin was Jason McIndale and no one even remembers Roger Kingsley. But that's also Roger Kingsley's fault for using like 40 decoys. Even Deadpool was one of the Hobgoblin decoys, it got so crazy! But now everyone just thinks Hobgoblin is the CEO of sex. There were so many ideas in this show that were completely original, and yet they've become so synonymous with the character that they almost work better than what was originally canon to the source material. These are good changes. And if you haven't noticed, there are a ton of things that were adapted directly to the Raimi Spider-Man movies. In fact, I would go so far as to say these movies are more adapting this cartoon than the comics. Look at the amount of parallels lifted directly from this show. Green Goblin is an alternate personality that is getting revenge on the Oscorp board of directors for mistreating Norman Osborn. The Goblin formula and glider weapons were built by Oscorp for someone else to use initially. Norman has an awkward dinner with Peter because he knows he's Spider-Man. Goblin drops Mary Jane off the bridge. Kurt Connors is a university professor. Peter fails to make it to a show Mary Jane is starring in. Aunt May and Peter go to the bank and then are interrupted by a supervillain bank robbery. Supervillain kidnaps Aunt May and uses her as a hostage to escape the bank heist. Otto Octavius is Peter's science hero. Otto is injured while trying to build a portable reactor that can produce infinite energy. He takes a hostage in his warehouse on the waterfront where he attempts to finish that machine. Harry flips out and yells at Peter at a party. Harry discovers Peter's identity and starts being goaded towards revenge by his father's ghost that keeps pushing him to become the new goblin and show him things that Harry couldn't possibly know on his own, so it's not a hallucination, it's actually a ghost, or his dad from another universe, maybe. Eddie Brock is Peter's rival at the Bugle, who he humiliates multiple times until ruining his career for trying to frame Spider-Man for a crime, introducing Gwen Stacy way later in the story. Aunt May gives Peter her and Ben's wedding rings for him and MJ to wear. Spidey clotheslines the other goblin in an alley, and he takes a header into a dumpster. The Venom symbiote gets to Earth through a meteorite. Peter getting the black suit almost shot for shot the exact same scene. A few of these are like that, honestly. Peter attempts to kill a supervillain because the suit has corrupted his mind. He takes it to Dr. Connors to examine a sample of it instead of the Fantastic Four. The suit drips directly off Peter and onto Eddie at the bottom of the bell tower. Sam Raimi and the men behind the scripts for these movies clearly loved this cartoon. I feel like it should get more credit for pioneering so many different takes on Spidey's home life and his relationships with his villains. Spider-Man the Animated Series was definitely a strong creative effort on the part of the writers, but part of that was because there were limitations placed on what the series could and could not do, as well as making the producers happy with some of the strange ideas. A fair amount of the show was also driven by, of course, action figures. This series was an action figure factory like none before, but what I think sets it apart once again is that the creators tried their best to make sure the costumes and objects from the toy line made sense in the show, leading to the original Spider-Verse trying to cover some of these alternate costumes in a reasonable way. One of the more famous and weirder tidbits of this show is that Hobgoblin appears before the Green Goblin. Because the previous showrunner had decided that Hobgoblin would be a major character, and the toy line already had him coming up in the first set. 
So, Semper and the creators had to come up with a logical reason for him to appear first, and settled on him basically being some goon that tests out Norman's weapons and goblin gimmick before he commits to doing it himself, and far better. Look at this toyetic monstrosity! His glider is giant and purple and plugs into an even bigger and gianter purple glider! Now that's an action figure! Every once in a while while watching this show with my friends, we would see a certain design and we would just shout audibly, out loud, Now that's an action figure! But toy sales weren't the only driving limitation with the show. They were also subject to heavy censorship! Just like every cartoon at this time. And today. I, I did not get notes any different from anyone else making animation for children then and probably now. Nothing changes. And I said, you know, we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. And, you know, be careful that I got a note once. Be careful that when Spider-Man lands on the roof, uh, you know, he doesn't harm the pigeons, which is a real note that I did get. What I didn't realize was that one day somebody was going to compile this as a list and put it on a wiki and it was going to become gospel, like somehow Spider-Man had gotten more censorship than any other cartoon show in the history of mankind. There was enough fighting going on in my own home base. Um, that I really didn't feel like fighting with broadcast standards and practices. I argued once for the use of a real gun because I thought it was integral to the story. That was when Robbie Robertson, uh, his son, was in a gang and the, it turned out that the gang was being run by Tombstone. And I went to the uh, BSNP person and said, I want this to be a recognizable gun. And she gave in because I really had not caused any huge amount of trouble for, you know, other things. For the record, we got no different treatment than anyone else on Saturday morning. We got nothing that I wasn't already used to. In fact, we probably got away with way more than I expected that we would get away with. They all had the same amount of censorship, except maybe Batman, because it was one of the first shows on the network, so they got more leeway. This series had the same rules as X-Men in later seasons of Batman and Gargoyles in any animated show on television today. It's become a really common misconception that this show was hit with network-mandated censorship especially hard, but it really just came down to John Semper Jr. and other writers wanting to play it more safe. They didn't believe that they needed Spider-Man punching his villains constantly, or characters firing guns, or characters dying, because if they used these things sparingly, it was more impactful when they did actually happen. Real guns do appear in the show, Spider-Man does hit people, and eventually this show has some of the more gut-wrenching death scenes in cartoons that really traumatize some kids. Spider-Man TAS could do all the things X-Men the Animated Series could, but just chose not to for safety. And honestly, I barely noticed as a kid that Spidey wasn't throwing a lot of punches. He's still grappling with people, webbing them up, kicking them, and throwing things at them, so the fight choreography isn't non-existent or anything. It often gets irritating for me hearing how people make this the only talking point about the show because they're operating off the misinformation that this series was somehow targeted harshly for content censorship when it really wasn't. And in spite of this cautious approach to its content, the show still had well-written and interesting character drama for Peter Parker's life in many trials. I, you know, I've come across this comment online and it infuriates me. Someone will go, well, I like that Spider-Man show but I have a problem with all that censorship. All that censorship just ruins it for me. I, it's, it's, the show is doomed and fatally flawed by all that censorship. Well, that's just bullshit. I mean, it's no different than the same broadcast standards and practices of a show that would be on the air right now. You know, for anyone that can look at the depth of storytelling that we had, and then be bothered by the fact that we had a laser rifle instead of an Uzi. I, I don't understand that. That's just silly to me. But the fact of the matter is, plot-wise, it doesn't change anything. It really doesn't. Because the key to good plotting is character interaction and suspense and conflict. And you can have all of those things without having to have people bleeding, people puking, and people dying. I mean, the, none of those other three things that I just mentioned are integral to great dramatic storytelling. Personally, I felt no limitation whatsoever. 
None whatsoever. I got to tell the stories that I wanted to tell. That's really all I have to say on the subject of the show censorship, because there's nothing else to say about it, and this show is interesting in so many other ways than that. Like the fact that Venom is voiced by Hank Azaria. All right, here's the 411, folks. Say some gangsta is pissing the fly, girl. Just give him what he eats. There's an impressive amount of voice talent backing this show. Legends like the great Ed Asner as J. Jonah Jameson, Jennifer Hale as Felicia Hardy slash Black Cat, the occasional appearance of Rob Paulson's Hydro Man, and Mark Hamill as Hobgoblin, and the aforementioned Mo Sislak as Eddie Brock. Not to mention the star of the show himself, Christopher Daniel Barnes. Most well known before this for playing Prince Eric in The Little Mermaid, Barnes grew up collecting comic books and was given the chance to live out childhood fantasy in bringing the earnest Peter Parker to life during the course of the five seasons. Being around the same age as this incarnation of Spider-Man, he feels completely natural and in his element as this character. I believe his ability and love for the source material was integral to bringing a sense of believability to the role, and he plays the character with a level of respect and love that can clearly be heard with his performance. Do you take me for a fool? Who amongst you has ever wanted to give up their superpowers? I have, because I've learned time and time again that with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Also, this Doc Ock is the one I hear when I read the comics, so I imagined all of Superior Spider-Man with Peter randomly talking in a German accent and no one noticing. Speaking of, this is a great take on Peter Parker. Right, really makes you, make you feel, feel like, like Spider- This is definitely the series' greatest strength. We follow him across the course of the series and we experience all of his highs and lows with him. Whether he's just trying to earn some extra money by getting a shot of a new supervillain for the paper, or volunteering as a teacher at a science foundation, or experiencing the greatest hardships back to back. We even get a sense of him maturing and coming of age even without him starting the show in high school. He certainly has his lows though. Like straight up pitfalls. This Spidey gets dumped on. Getting put through the ringer so often has him wanting to quit being a superhero at least once a season. But he never falls into feeling like a complete train wreck of a human being to the point of self-parody. Nor is he like a Netflix Marvel superhero where he's gotta quit every mid-season and be like, oh, I gotta throw his costume away, I, I can't wear this no more, I'm gonna spend a whole episode just soul-searching and being, being, feeling sad for myself. The love behind this project ended up producing one of the most accurate representations of the character we've ever seen. As much as I've clearly gushed over this show, it's not without its flaws. Some storylines get a little too long and start to really drag in the middle. As much as I like Blade and Punisher showing up, I feel that some of the stuff with Morbius got a bit tedious because so much time was devoted to it, and I don't particularly like that character. And it pains me to say this, but I was so bored by the Six Forgotten Warriors arc. More like Six Forgettable Warriors. On every rewatch now, I just skip to the Hydro Simp again and get the ball rolling on the final arc. It was an attempt at building up a way to introduce Captain America into the Marvel Animated Universe through a Spider-Man story, but I could care less about all the older superheroes Spidey bumps into along the way, and I think having Red Skull's son become Electro was unexpected, but also a little weird. I mentioned earlier that Electro and Sandman were slated to be in the James Cameron movie, so they weren't allowed to be used for this series. When the movie fell apart and never released, Semper decided to toss Electro in here as a big bad, and elected to not use Sandman because he was already content using Hydro Man in about the same role. This series also hit a lot of rough deadlines, so there's some jagged edges on the animation here and there. Like errors, reused footage, or certain scenes looking a bit stiff. They didn't quite have the animation budget from X-Men, which is reflected in how the character shading is more simplified and they couldn't polish the timing for the show as much with editing. This show feels really spastically edited because, like, there's always music blaring at full volume in the background and everything moves so fast. I do think that this show visually cleans up better for digital releases better than all the other shows for some reason. It just looks nicer on a modern TV than X-Men. The line work is more crisp, and the color palette is more pretty on modern devices. I, I can't really put my finger on why. It could be that the traditional parts of the show would have been digitized back then in order to combine it all with the CG elements that make up the backgrounds, but that's really just a guess on my part. I also wish this Spidey was allowed more appearances in other shows from the classic Marvel animated universe. I mean, he was the unofficial star of Marvel Team-Up before they decided they couldn't live the lie any longer and just retitled the book to Spider-Man Team-Up. But Semper was a bit 
protective of this Spidey and didn't want him being used in a place where he wasn't in total control of how the character was utilized. So Spider-Man couldn't show up in X-Men, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, or Hulk beyond small cameos in each. However, everyone else was totally allowed to jump into this show whenever. We have a big two-part team-up with the 90s X-Men, Iron Man and War Machine help him battle Venom and Carnage, and the Fantastic Four show up in the Secret Wars arc. This show also has the same Daredevil that hangs out with Fantastic Four in their own show, and Hydro Man even fights them once. There's enough there in the way of a shared connection to say that, yeah, sure, these shows are all definitely in the same universe, but I think it would have been more fun to have Spidey be a full-on guest character in the other shows as well. As mentioned, Mary Jane was the main love interest in this show, and they decided to not use Gwen Stacy for so much of it because they wanted to avoid having to show her death. But the decision was made to sort of meld her character with Felicia Hardy before she became Black Cat. As for getting rid of Mary Jane instead of killing her off, the show decided to use portals to other dimensions as a way to semi-permanently dispatch characters they wanted to kill off, so it makes sense why they stopped appearing without shutting down the possibility of them coming back entirely. And without scarring small children by uh, showing Cletus Cassidy getting his head bitten off or something. This opened up the portal door to a whole host of wacky stories with characters using portals to go to other dimensions, which ended up really bolstering the show's final season. The main through line of this series is the wise old woman who can see through time and space named Madam Web, watching Spider-Man take on various tests of his will and character to see if he's the right person to stop some kind of impending doom that will wipe out all of the entire multiverse. Like infinite trillions of deaths simultaneously on the horizon. She jumps into his life every couple of days or weeks to tell him he's about to encounter something rough and encourages him to make the right choice without telling him what to do outright. And even though he's a grouchy jerk that wants to quit being Spider-Man constantly, he ends up always making the right choice anyway, making this particular Spider-Man special. Finally, at the end of this series, after losing Mary Jane to who knows where forever, losing his best friend and being put through the ringer in a bunch of really messed up ways, and then being tossed into a pretty cool adaptation of Secret Wars, he's finally called upon for his final battle. He's gotta fight another Spider-Man. Madam Web tells Peter he has to lead the charge of various multiversal versions of himself to save all of time and space from another Spider-Man who went insane with grief and bonded to the Carnage symbiote to become a ruthless genocidal dictator that's planning to use the dimensional portal technology to kill everyone, everywhere, ever. The reason our Spidey is so special is because he didn't lose himself in his grief like Spider-Carnage. He overcame a lot of challenges that came with getting his powers was almost permanently mutated into a monster by them, he proved he was ready to lead another group of superheroes during Secret Wars, and he was humbled by so many bad things happening to him that he didn't end up being an arrogant jerk like the Spider-Man in the old trusty Spidey armor. It's not just being Peter Parker that makes him special, it's being this Peter Parker, shaped and molded by all of his experiences into a stronger leader and a really powerful force for good. Pretty much everything leads up to this final moment, and I won't spoil how he chooses to save the day from his evil doppelganger because it's a really great moment and even gets a bit shockingly dark afterwards too. If you haven't seen it, I think it's worth it to watch this show just for the main overarching story that builds up to this big finale arc because it's a great payoff to Spidey's hero's journey in a way that sets him apart from a lot of Spider-Man interpretations at the end. There's just one little loose end that never got quite resolved. Where's Mary Jane? The show ends with Madam Web saying she's still alive somewhere in the multiverse and she's going to help Peter find MJ finally, but it was canceled by the network before we could see that happen. Over the years, John Semper has made it clear that he had a fair amount of ideas in place for that sixth season, like finding MJ in a Victorian London version of the Marvel Universe where Carnage was Jack the Ripper. At conventions, he used to hand out a script he whipped up for what that could have looked like, and he even had the cast read some portions of it for a panel at a convention. But it's a quick and short script that doesn't feel quite like it would have been the thing we'd have seen on TV had the final season been made. And there's still so many characters left up in the air that the script doesn't even mention. What happened to Green Goblin, The Spot, or Venom? My friends Dane, Jacob, and I were so racked with grief over the loose threads that we even made a fan comic trying to use some of the unmade Season 6 ideas as well as my own take on how you could fold in some of the lost characters from the series. Maybe check it out and tell me what you think in the comments. 
We're still working on it because making comics is hard and takes a while, but I think it's a really fun project and it's nice telling a story about Spidey for once instead of just talking about them. Nothing's going to stop Spider-Man. I'm going to use all my resources to ruin Spider-Man for this. Isn't the hero supposed to get the girl? We know everything about you. Parker, this is one situation you cannot crawl away from. I can save the world ten times over, but when I need help, I'm on my own. No, you can't quit. You can do anything. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. I held the curtain for you, Spider-Man. I wouldn't want you to miss the show. Let her go, Osborne. Not you. Do we sense a pattern here, Bruce? We masked men must hide so much from the world. But I can't do this alone. I did it. I beat the most relentless, unforgiving opponent I've ever faced. You made me believe in myself again. I do know who I am now. And I'll be ready. And for the first time ever, I wouldn't want to change anything about me. Amen to that, dear lady. Amen to that. This show may not have gotten the perfect official ending, but it stopped at a place that, while feeling pretty satisfying leaving off on Peter's resolving his multi-season character arc, left a lot of us clamoring for more and excited to dig further into Spider-Man as a character. I think this show made super fans out of a million kids in the 90s and sparked such a passion for the character in his world. Its impact as a more streamlined take on Spidey is completely undeniable, and even 20 plus years later, we're still using some of its ideas in modern adaptations. This series shows why sometimes it's okay to stray from the source material if it's in service of bolstering the best moments and ideas from it, but also gives us some of the best examples of following that material really closely too, with some great adaptations of classic comic stories. If you're looking to get into Spider-Man but feel intimidated by the sheer amount of comics, this series is a safe bet because it adapts the broad strokes really well while also compiling the more messy parts into a simple form. The Clone Saga in this show is a lot more simple than all that. Spider-Man the Animated Series is a really unique piece of history with the character because very rarely do you get an adaptation of such a major character with so few cooks in the kitchen. And that nearly singular creative voice really helped narrow it all down into a really well-told series that reimagines him, but also still truly understands the heart of Spider-Man's core, while also trying to stay positive and hopeful. Now, I know everyone has their favorite Spidey cartoon, and the usual picks are one of these three, depending on when you were born. For three different generations, these are the definitive adaptations of Spidey in animation. But there's a middle chapter in here from the early 2000s that is often looked past. One is a series that seemed like a strange and unique idea that no one really gravitated towards, and another that was ambitious and mature but didn't quite catch on. These are the two unloved middle children of Spider-Man cartoons, the ones that only lasted 13 episodes each, the ones that don't get much fan art or belated action figures or a video essay about why they're so awesome. But I'm in four videos deep, so I'll be the one to cover them, I guess. I told you part three wouldn't take seven months, it only took 15. Which tells you my level of interest in making Spider-Man content at this point. Haha, <laughs> not a Spider-Man channel, so funny, I love that joke. <coughs> don't, don't put that in, don't put that in. Ben, don't put that, uh, Ben, Ben. Justice League Unlimited. This show is bizarre. It's not based on any comic storylines in particular. It features dozens of original characters. It doesn't even take place on Earth. And it's not a sequel to the previous cartoon. They try to trick you and make you think it might be a continuation with this little musical cue. What could possibly be? But they didn't get permission to use that shit. Spider-Man Unlimited was one of those shows made to fulfill a contractual obligation, not because anyone was really eager to make it, which as we know leads to some of the best superhero stuff. Marvel Entertainment and Fox Kids had a deal to put out another Spider-Man show in 1999 to reinvigorate the Spidey brand after the 90s show was cancelled. Originally, it was supposed to be some kind of super low-budget motion comic style adaptation of the first 26 issues of the books. But then Sony and Marvel made a deal to do the movie. We all remember the movie? This one actually came out. And part of that deal was a side cartoon series that would use the comics as source material. This conflicted with Spider-Man Unlimited's production, and when the dust settled, they were told that they weren't allowed to use any of Spider-Man's supporting cast, 
his classic costume, or adapt any comic stories from the classic books. So the producers are like, well shit, what do we do now? Oh wait, Spider-Man 2099 is a thing because it's the 90s. So for about a week they were working on that, but then decided it was just a little too similar to Batman Beyond, which was already in itself very heavily influenced by both versions of Spider-Man, for its main character being a high school superhero and its setting being in a cyberpunk future. It's a ripoff of a ripoff of a spinoff. For a while, they were settled on having Spidey go to another version of Earth where his Uncle Ben hadn't died and he didn't have the mental fortitude to fight off the symbiote and became the Venom of that world. Then one of the producers was like, no, Clone Saga will live in infamy and this is the 90s so that's a really fresh wound, so don't do two Peter Parkers! And as such, we finally got this end result. This is a weird Frankenstein's monster of all these rules, stipulations, and sources of inspiration. It's kind of Batman Beyond, because look, he's got a fancy suit, he could turn invisible. It's kind of Spider-Man 2099, he's jumping on a car, he's got the cape. It's kind of classic Spider-Man, and uh, it's, I guess it's like kind of Thundercats 2 somehow. And it's, um, it's not bad. Well, okay, it is, but I also kind of like it. The plot of this one, which I'll admit is a bit of a nightmare train wreck, is that scientists have discovered there's an identical planet to Earth on the opposite side of the sun from us that's got its own advanced society and civilization just doing their own thing. How no one on either planet managed to notice this before 1999 is beyond me, so they send astronaut John Jameson there to go make first contact with the local populace. Except for reasons not explained until later, Venom and Carnage are compelled to hijack the shuttle and go to Counter-Earth 2 for some nefarious plan. As a kid, I was instantly annoyed that Carnage and Venom were teaming up and referring to themselves in the singular, and also, like, morphing around like Clayface. A symbiote is gooey, yes, but you can't walk through a chain-link fence with one. There's still a human being with bones inside there, man! Even the show calls this out as being weird and wrong, but they don't explain how or why suddenly they can do this stuff. Hey, you two could never morph like that before. I just may be outgunned here. Or why these sworn enemies that hate each other in a dozen other comics and adaptations are just like... Just calling each other brother and are like total besties now. Can't contain us! What have you done with our brother Venom? The first episode is my favorite of the whole show because it's the one that feels the most like an actual Spider-Man cartoon instead of all this other weird stuff. Peter Parker fails to stop Venom and Carnage from boarding John's shuttle, and he has to fortnight his way back to the familiar planet Earth of people who think he's a colossal dumbass that can't do nothing right. He's a social pariah and gets his ass kicked constantly until he's just wondering if he should hang it up for good. But he sees a transmission from John Jameson saying everything on Counter Earth has gone real counterproductive, and he needs some help. So Spodily Mang steals some unstable molecules from the Fantastic Four, makes himself a video game unlockable costume that's stylistically designed to be impossible to cosplay, and makes off with his own shuttle to opposite land. Listen up, world. This is Spider-Man, on my way to counter Earth to save John Jameson and clear my good name. And I'm going with him, Peter Parker. After all, what newspaper man could turn down an opportunity like this? You could tell this show was written really fast without a great long-term plan because that makes no goddamn sense. Let's say everything goes great, and he gets John home really fast. How's he going to explain why only Peter Parker or Spider-Man are going to step off the spaceship and not both? Oh yeah, Spider-Man, um, heroically died on Counter-Earth or something. Just me now. That could be how he quits in this show. Cause Spider-Man are always quitting on me in this time period. Were they going to have him explain to John the double identity thing and they'd have to come up with a plan together? Maybe just land the shuttle far away from people and then say Spider-Man got out and ran off on his own and it's just Peter and John there. I don't... I don't know. Either way, he set himself up for failure because three people need to walk out of this thing at the end of the journey. Think before you speak, dude! And we get to the main setting of the series where it gets a lot less interesting. Oh. Counter-Earth is a land where a scientist who now calls himself the High Evolutionary 
has learned how to accelerate evolution in animals to make them bipedal and intelligent like humans. And then he decides that those are way cooler than humans and asserts that as the new dominant species in society under his rule, while normal humans are considered the lower class minority because they're not big cool rhino dudes or tiger guys. Yeah, yeah, get your jokes out now. Spider-Man escaped from the planet of the furries. You'd think the mutant animal people would be considered the freaks and treated as the oppressed class on this planet, but somehow it's flipped. And also this planet has flying cars and way more advanced technology. Spidey discovers John Jameson has joined the underground human resistance fighting for equality with... with the bestials. Yes, that's... they're called the bestials, these things. We couldn't have found a better name? It really had to be that? How did not one person on the production think that was strange? Were they laughing and thinking the kids wouldn't get it so they could just get away with it and it's all a big joke? Anyway, Peter lives in a slum in Counter-Earth's New York with some doctor that's a landlord and her son and sells pictures of Spider-Man to another newspaper on this planet because sometimes you just gotta stick with what you know. Also, he teams up with the Resistance and battles a rotating cast of Counter-Earth variants of established Spider-Man villains. Like Electro, but he's an electric eel. Yeah, that'll do it. Or Craven, but he's actually pretty much just exactly the same as normal Craven. He just has a different haircut, I guess. I can't believe Rhino and Scorpion weren't here. That seems really obvious. Maybe they, maybe they weren't allowed to use them. This show's so crazy. I blame this show for all the damn nano machine suits in the movies. How do his shoes fit inside the fucking? How does it do that in both things? I'm confused. Though I do wish this costume would appear in something other than the games and that weird comic where Carnage is replaced by another Carnage from an alternate universe so it got really weird and convoluted. Yeah, a version of this world got killed off by Moreland and Spider-Verse, but they said it's an offshoot, not the canon ending to this show or Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Don't you even bring up that dumb bullshit in the comments, you goober. See, another one of these guys is over here in Spider-Geddon a few years later. He's fine. There's like an infinite number of Spider-Man Unlimited universes. Because that's, I mean, that's how that works. I will praise this series for a few things. The art style is incredible. I love the heavy inking and the vibrant colors on the backgrounds. These character designs are really complex and detailed, and I can't believe they made those poor animators draw these frame by frame. I wish we could have another animated series that looked this good, because this style is great. This is the best looking of all the 90s Marvel cartoons, in my opinion. And of course, the voice acting is pretty good. Reno Romano was chosen to play Spidey, and he did such a great job, they brought him on board to voice the two video games from around this time. A Spider-Man made off with Octavius' new invention, but not THE Spider-Man, not me. Somebody's framed me. Why? I don't know yet. And if New York's finest catch me, it may be too late. Even though those were kind of offshoots of the 90s show. I wish he'd voice this character again in something because I'm really nostalgic for his performance from these games. Plus, he's got enough range that he also voices Counter-Earth's version of Green Goblin, who's actually an anti-hero and member of the Human Resistance. Yes, there's only one thing to do. It's dangerous, but the fate of the world depends on it. I will do what no other superhero on the planet would even consider. Drafty in here. Also, my pal Gary Chalk is here as Counter-Earth's New York newspaper editor-in-chief. Subscribe to Xavier for more videos like this one. Once again, this series is not in continuity with the 1994 show. Even within this show, they have flashbacks to this Spidey's version of the Symbiote Saga, and it's similar, but still out of sync. Ending with Venom being brought in by S.H.I.E.L.D. instead of the police, and him choosing to make Carnage as a partner to help him fight Spider-Man, instead of all that nonsense with Baron Mordo and Dormammu and what the fuck. Plus, Cletus and Eddie swapped hair colors for some reason. You really only need to watch a handful of episodes of this show to get the gist, and then there's a lot of filler in the middle that's not particularly good. Sorry, I just don't care much for the tragic backstory of Git, the mute guy that is made of sentient bandages and wears sandals. All the stuff focused on Venom and Carnage is way off from the comics, but are some of the stronger episodes in this show, weirdly enough. Eddie Brock's character is still pretty well preserved in this. He's just under some kind of mind control from Venom being connected to a hive mind of green prehistoric symbiotes that live on Counter-Earth and have over time evolved into insects or something. 
I could barely follow the show, but I don't dislike it. You could put it on and zone out while running on the treadmill because Comic-Con is right around the corner and you gained a lot of depression weight during the last two years, but hey, you're finally married and things are a little better, so it's time to start taking care of yourself again so you can feel confident wearing spandex in a public space. Projecting slightly... But alas, Pokemon was a runaway success, and most animated TV networks at the time wanted to chase that money train, so Marvel stuff was left in the dust for a bit, and this show was shut down before staff writer Larry Brody could script where to go from here. This series feels like it was destined to end abruptly. There's no way this could have carried on for any more than like two seasons maximum before it got tedious and even weirder. Even if they did outline plans for 11 more episodes after this, at some point you just have to let Spidey go home. It ends on a monster of a cliffhanger where everything goes wrong all at once, the villains get away, and Spidey and friends are buried under a collapsing building while an army of symbiotes invades the whole city like those three video games where that happened. How season 2 could tie this in a neat and tidy bow, I have no idea, but I'll give it my best shot! Hey, self-plug, go read my fan comic. I can't make money off of it, but I like when people tell me I did a good job and pat me on the head and say they're proud of me because my mom never did because she's just like, Oh, you listen to your wife when she tells you to do the dishes, but not me. I see how it is, Xavier. Anyway, Spider-Man Unlimited. This time, he's gone too far. The all-new, all-improved Spider-Man. Davison's rescue is my responsibility. The only one who can bring him home. After all the times I've risked my life for this stinking city, this is the thanks I get. Some things do change. No matter where I go in the universe, everybody hates Spider-Man. Please, help. But there's one request I can't turn down. Perfect society nears completion. How long have you been following me? Long enough to know your deepest, darkest secret, Parker. Soon we will have an army of symbiotes. Someday, somehow, back you will play Not great or terrible. Certainly could have been a lot worse, but it's such a strange and off-the-wall show, and there's no way they'd make something this dramatically far off from your traditional Spidey ever again. I find it special just because of how unique it is and the fact that it happened at just the right time before a show like this could never be made again. Because the movie came out shortly after and skyrocketed Spidey's popularity to new heights. Now everyone had a pretty standardized idea of what Spider-Man stuff should look like, and all the shows hereafter would follow suit. The closest to the cinematic Spidey being this handsome low polygon gentleman that has the same haircut but was allowed to cuss and go to parties with beer. Spider-Man had a rough transition to 3D. From the fellas at Mainframe Entertainment who brought you Uncanny Valley Nightmare Fuel and the most underrated Transformers cartoon, comes Spidey's first foray into a fully 3D animated setting. Boy, we've come a long way to Spider-Verse. This series was produced by Brian Michael Bendis and originally started out as an adaptation of his and Mark Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man books. Early into the show's life, Bendis himself penned a pilot for the show, and it was eventually picked up by MTV. Which is a weird choice, but I, I, I guess I can't see this really running on Fox Kids as it is. You can see a lot of Ultimate Spider-Man influence on the visual presentation of this show. A few years later, when the angsty little rascal himself had his debut in a 3D video game, he and his world ended up looking very similar to this take. Cell Shaded 3D was new at the time and was a very popular style for comic book adaptations. I wish more stuff looked like this these days. The look of this show is really special, and while not aging as gracefully as the aforementioned video game, it's still really impressive for the time, and as much as I love Beast Wars, this show looks a hell of a lot better than the studio's previous work. This time around, Mainframe Studios were given the task of creating a new Spider-Man show to coincide with the success of Sam Raimi's mega-blockbuster event of 2002. With a director who previously worked on CG television shows, backed by a studio who pioneered the first fully CGI cartoon reboot, Adu Payton was very eager to give Spider-Man a fresh spin with a stylish coat of paint. The team set out to do something that had never been done before. 
They wanted to bring the colorful and dynamic lighting of a comic book to life in a way that couldn't be done with traditional 2D animation on a TV budget. Alongside the obvious Ultimate slash Bagley influence on the youthful look of our characters, I do also cited Romita and Todd McFarlane's artistic styles as having influenced the show. We've been looking at comic books, uh, uh, John Romita Jr.'s work, uh, John Romita Sr., um, uh, McFarlane. Uh, a number of great artists have um, supported the Spider-Man stories over the years, and for us, one of the first steps was just to put all that stuff in front of us. You can even see the McFarlane dubbed spaghetti webbing he popularized during his tenure at Marvel made its way into the show. Plus, this is the only cartoon Spidey that frequently does these back-breaking Todd McFarlane poses with ease. Damn, that is a flexible man! I hear a lot of people say this show is unwatchable and the animation is ugly and it looks bad and blah blah blah. And you guys are spoiled by your damn Nickelodeon Ninja Turtles and your Clone Wars and your small titty goth GF show. All this movie quality animation on television now, I can tell none of you bitches had to contend with Max Steel. No, the old Max Steel. It's not that far off from these other shows from around the same time, but the cell shaded filter goes a long way to hiding the seams, I think. Plus, the actual animation, which is different from art style, is buttery smooth. This Spidey moves like water! He's so fast! And these moves are badass! I love the fight choreography in this series. We still haven't gotten a Spider-Man that can zip around like this in more recent shows, and I think that shows the strength of the 3D keyframe fight scenes. All of the Peter Parker daily life stuff is motion captured to feel more casual and believable, but Spider-Man's movements are hand animated to make him feel more super, and it really sets the two halves of the show apart. I think the art style also allowed for some really cool shots of Spidey at night with full black shadows and rim lighting that look really dramatic. You can get some cool wallpapers from this shit at least. Give them a break kids, they tried their best. I forgot to put the cell shaded filter on that lab coat in the background, so that has smooth shading, so so this sucks actually, zero out of ten. This show once again follows college freshman Peter Parker, who seemingly has gone through the events of the previous year's theatrical mega hit. There's quite a few cartoons that start like this, where the live action movie is implied to be the backstory behind the show, but it obviously branches from the story of the movie if it's set between sequels. Like the last show, there's enough here to place this squarely in its own universe, such as MJ, Harry, and Flash Thompson going to ESU alongside Peter, and the Osbournes aren't exactly themselves, but it's close enough to imagine at the time that this was continuing the story audiences were eager to see more of. Before the sequel came along and completely squashed this poor cartoon's hopes and dreams of ever being canon, Spidey's got organic webs and shares the same emblems and shiny webs on his costume, Norman is dead and Harry blames Spider-Man for it. Harry, I get that you think Spider-Man killed your father. On account of he did? If only I could cause you the pain that you've caused me. First we'll see who's behind the mask. I can look into your eyes as you die. Spider-Man. No. It can't be. Peter is working freelance for Jameson, and Mary Jane and Spider-Man mention sharing arguably the most iconic movie kiss. Well, sure, there was that kiss, but it's not like we ever went out salsa dancing or anything like that. Peter faces off against a bunch of C-listers and original characters throughout this series, likely due to restrictions from Sony as to not have two conflicting versions of Doc Ock or Black Cat, since she was originally considered for the sequel. A whole lot of that going around with these shows. Just very specific circumstances that result in something that's quite unlike anything else before or after. We see a handful of familiar faces like Silver Sable, Electro, eventually Craven, and poor old Doc Connors. Oof, this uh, this didn't have a happy end. But the greatest of them all, Michael Clark Duncan's Kingpin makes an appearance, making this Spider-Man also dubiously canon to the Daredevil movie at the time. But outside of them, it's all new guys created just for the show. A couple of them don't even get their names dropped, so you have no idea what to call them. Talon is this universe's resident cat burglar, but most people would probably forget about this newspaper prop and just call her by her real name, Cheyenne, since Talon is never actually spoken out loud. 
You can honestly just replace her with Black Cat in your brain and this episode still works exactly the same. The leader of this terrorist group with high-tech jackets and sci-fi guns called Teradax doesn't even get a prop calling attention to his name. I had to look at the concept art for the show to find out what it was and I still can't remember it. Trying to watch this show nowadays is incredibly annoying because not only is it almost never streaming on anything, but when it is, or when you purchase it, it's always out of order. It's always listed in its air date, which is unfortunately all over the damn place because it turns out creating the future is really difficult with 2002 technology. Episodes that canonically come first are often held until later in the season because they just flat out weren't finished yet. Whatever was ready was what came out, which means characters that haven't been introduced yet will walk in a frame like you've known them for a while, or events will be called back to that haven't happened yet. Max Dillon becomes Electro and then dies and then shows up in class again to tell Peter not to mess around with one of the many thousands of goth girls voiced by Tara Strong that made it in here. Only the DVD release of the entire season has the episodes right. Here's the order for anyone interested, by the way. Other than its animation style, the thing that really sets this series apart from every other Spidey cartoon is its maturity. Since it was aired on MTV, this was a TV-14 show that could mention alcohol, depict characters drinking and smoking, show firearms and blood and death, and they could even cuss. Hello? Good guy? Saved your butt? Me? On the ground now! Damn it! And some of these episodes got pretty damn dark. It's pretty much everything the 1994 series chose not to do all packaged together. And I think it makes a strong case for some of these more adult elements also making for interesting and dramatic storytelling. For example, this show's take on bullying pulls no punches with showing the origin of Max Dillon, a shy nerd looking to fit in with the cool frat guys, into the deadly and murderous Electro. They torture this poor kid over and over, but he's so desperate for their approval, he puts up with it with this weak, fake smile. The bullies invite Max to a frat party, which is just a trick for another brutal hazing prank that leaves him feeling humiliated and powerless, until his powers activate. Because he's secretly a mutant from X-Men, I guess? Look it up. And the first thing he does is kill the guy who picked on him all this time. And Peter reaches out to him, knowing what it's like to be bullied and given the powers to finally stand up for yourself. He pleads with Max to settle down and stop hurting people, but he's just too manic to listen to reason and sees everyone as his enemy. In the early 2000s, post-Columbine, there were a lot of animated shows doing episodes like this, but of all of them I've seen, this one just feels the most brutally truthful to the reality of things. It doesn't end with them making up and being friends and going to school together like normal. It ends in a graveyard. I just hope wherever Max is, he's finally found some peace. <laughs> it's a really powerful episode that demonstrates the full gambit of what this show was capable of doing that no series before or since could. But this series also has its lighthearted and fun elements too. I really love the banter and chemistry between Peter, MJ, and Harry in this show, and no Spidey cartoon outside of this has really nailed that dynamic the same way. How about if I come late? He's not coming. I'm serious. He is so not coming. Yeah, unless later means... Never. never. Hello? I said I'm coming. What am I, invisible? This MJ feels closer to the comics version than Kirsten Dunst because she's more the pursuer in the relationship and wants to get to know Peter and get in his head, and he's the one who brushes her off and puts up a wall. I think Harry thinks maybe we have things to talk about. I, uh, 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 these binocs are pretty, uh, fly. It's kind of flipped from the movie relationship where Peter's chasing her at exactly all the moments when it's most inconvenient in her life, and she's like, are you fucking kidding me, bro? I'm marrying the leader of the human resistance against the bestials. I can't do this wishy-washy shit right now, man. That poor, sad werewolf man was abandoned at the altar. Harry Osborn is also a funny-ass character in this show. <laughs> you suck, Osborn! <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> He's such a chillaxed dude, bro, and he only gets intense when Spider-Man is brought up. Like, of all the Harry Osborns in all the cartoons, I think this one is the most charismatic and the one that's like, I could actually see why Peter would be his friend because he's not just an annoying, sniveling dweeb. I've already got it all figured out. 
Actress parties, supermodel parties, actress and supermodel parties. Yeah, I'm sure MJ can't wait for those. Oh good, then we're on the same wavelength. Peter is voiced this time by Neil Patrick Harris, and I think he gives a really strong performance. Hot roof, hot roof, ah. Welcome to Spidey's Cardio Workout. What the? He doesn't sound like Tobey Maguire, really. He's just doing his own thing, and it works. He's got this really nerdy nervousness as Peter Parker. Actually, Spider-Man is a man. Sort of. But his voice becomes very commanding and strong as Spidey. And I've even heard that they pitched it down a little so his Spider-Man could sound more intimidating. I think that's a cool idea. I'm gonna rip you apart, Draven. Hey, you know what I'm feeling right now? Yeah. No, but I'm going to a whorehouse and I'm gonna get my fuck on. If you two don't wanna get your dicks wet, that's fine with me. I honestly really like this series and their take on the Spider-Man mythos. Something still comic booky, but also very down to earth and close to reality. I think Spider-Man: The New Adventures of Batman or whatever deserves a little more love. If you can look past the admittedly aged visuals, you'll see that the story is pretty solid. But as with all weird 13 episode long cartoon shows that were cancelled abruptly, CLIFFHANGER! The new Spider-Man series of animated episodes about Spider-Man ends with a two-parter where these villains called the Gaines Twins use mind control powers to turn Spider-Man into their personal assassin to get revenge on Kraven the Hunter for a personal vendetta they have against him. Spidey really lets loose here and it gets pretty brutal in this fight, until he comes to his senses. When he goes after the twins for putting a brain whammy on him and kidnapping Mary Jane, they trick him into injuring his friend Indy Daimonji, a journalist that Peter has a romance with throughout the show. She's put into a coma from him not pulling his punches with her, and he feels like Spider-Man is just too dangerous to leave unchained, so he hangs it up. And by hanging it up, I mean he puts it in a suitcase and throws it in the river. This is one of the only Spider-Man stories to my knowledge that actually ends with him definitively going, nah, this sucks, and quitting permanently. Obviously, this was going to be resolved in Season 2 as their attempt to adapt Spider-Man no more, but it never happened. Imagine if Spider-Man 2 just ended right here. It's such a bummer of an ending. And this series wasn't cancelled because it had low ratings, it was actually doing very well. MTV just decided it didn't fit in with the rest of their programming because they were getting away from adult animation, more into reality shows and irredeemable annoying garbage. 24-7 shows about rock stars remodeling your house! It's the same reason the Beavis and Butthead reboot got canned. No, not the new reboot, the other reboot from 2011. They're really doing that twice? Same with Futurama? Man, 90s kids just really can't let anything go, can they? Would the world, like, come to an end if Spider-Man took one lousy night off? Okay, you made your point. Ever wonder what my life is like? It's like this. Cut me a little slack. I'm trying to catch a bad guy. The only bad guy I see here is you! Can't catch a break. There's someone else. Anybody I know? I don't think he even knows. Excuse me. I bet the X-Men get to go to parties. Pants in the air! Choosing a side of good doesn't necessarily make you a hero. Not with everyone. These two shows are very strange and distinctive compared to everything else we've gotten for Spidey in the realm of animated shows. I commend both of them for trying something really different that gave them such strong defining traits. And while neither of them are perfect, and can both have some real duds for episodes, they also have some strong ones that are worth checking out if you're a fan of the character. They both understood and utilized Spider-Man in interesting ways, and I think they deserve some recognition for at least attempting something cool, even if these attempts were formed by stringent mandates and troubled productions. Maybe think of these as like one show that was a weird anthology that switched off concepts each season, so it's less depressing that they both got tossed in the trash so quickly before really taking off. And even though these were both a little out there in their own ways, a more traditional Spidey show was still on the horizon. In the latter half of the 2000s, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy by Columbia Pictures and Sony is finally winding down as the studio gets into uncertain territory about the fourth film. 
Spider-Man's hit big in the world of video games with multiple open world hits in a row, and the time has come for another animated series to keep the brand invigorated and alive as we wait to see what the next movie becomes. So cartoon vets Greg Weissman and Victor Cook were tasked by Sony to create a serialized Spidey TV series to fill in the gaps and breathe in some new life for the character after his last cartoon outings all kept him relatively the same as a college-age superhero. Believe it or not, putting him back in high school was not an incredibly annoying decision at that time. He was in high school for barely any of the movies, hadn't been there for decades in the comics, and the video games barely had time to show any of his life at home. So, Cook and Weissman took Spidey back to his roots as a 16-year-old high school superhero. But the plan for the series to span time through his school career from fall to summer vacation each year until he's graduated and moving on to college. They had a lot of big multi-year plans for this series that we'll talk about later. And I felt that was conducive to stronger storytelling because nothing felt like it came out of left field. The foreshadowing was implanted for everything that happened in the series, and it introduces characters long before they become relevant. So when they do take the center stage, you're like, oh yeah, I've seen that guy like three or four times before in the background. This show is a masterclass in setup and payoff. You can thank me later, dude. We all know now that these long-term plans didn't exactly come to fruition, as the show was cancelled after two seasons due to the Disney and Marvel merger in 2009. And often the only conversations we have about this show revolve around that cancellation and how much we all wish it would come back. But you've got to be realistic and come to terms with the fact that this isn't really likely going to happen. Instead of being the millionth video encouraging a hashtag campaign to bring it back, Let's just talk about what the show did and didn't do that made it so unique and appreciate it for what it is instead of lingering on what it unfortunately could have been. And yeah, what else is there to say? Spectacular Spider-Man is almost perfect. The Spectacular Spider-Man charts the early years of this show's take on Spidey as he grows and matures through his high school career as well as develops complex relationships with a massive cast of side characters that are all really strongly characterized. Every person he comes in contact with is an interesting and fleshed out character that could have multiple episodes about them too. But of course no one overshadows Peter Parker himself. This is a fantastic take on Spidey. He's angsty but not too angsty, he's smart but not too smart, he's a nerd but not like a socially inept loser, he's also comic accurate in that he can't walk two feet without a girl falling in love with him. Don't you just love my balls? Hot sticky wet balls coming at ya! He's flawed and makes genuine mistakes in this show that can't be rationalized away, and he learns from those mistakes. But he's still a lovable character. Of all the cartoons, I'd say this is definitely the richest and most complex take on Peter that translates him pretty much perfectly from the comics. Every adaptation focuses on specific traits in particular, but this one is the most well-rounded and complete translation I can think of. That spot-on Parker writing goes hand-in-hand -hand with this well-developed cast of friends and begrudging ally frenemies. His home life is so crucial because it sets him apart from other heroes. Subtle things like the multi-episode arc beginning with him being admonished by Aunt May for staying out too late on a school night. You're to be home by 10 o'clock. That's my bedtime. But Aunt May... If you're late, you call. And in the following episodes, having to call if he's up past his curfew. It's slow going, but uh, I'll, I'll be home soon. I hope so. The weatherman predicted rain. You don't have your umbrella. Yeah, somehow I doubt an umbrella would help. Little things like that make it feel more real, like he's a real kid. I love that this show managed to accurately show the evolution of enemies to friends that Peter and Flash Thompson have in a way that felt natural and not forced or too quick. If you're hanging up on the She-Geek, that proves you're still a stuck-up egghead. A guy who can't even see when his friends are trying to help. They even went so far as to adapt Harry Osborn's battle with drug addiction while also keeping it within the bounds of cartoon content restrictions. This is the only thing to ever adapt that arc, it's crazy. Like, even Semper couldn't finagle something like that. They just swapped out the heroine with a fictional performance-enhancing drug developed by Oscorp that he uses to get better at sports and improve his grades. I got straight A's on my midterms, I made the varsity football team first string, and I have a date to tonight's fall formal with one of the hottest Harry, girls in- Harry, can't you see I'm in a meeting? This show was written so well that they somehow managed to have a whodunit with Green Goblin and legitimately make you think that Norman Osborn isn't the lead suspect. I mean, you feel stupid when you realize it is because like, of, of course, but wow. 
It's like that Hobgoblin stuff, but good. Plus, all the juicy girl problems and love triangles are just great. Somehow, Liz Allen is best girl. I don't know how to reconcile that. MJ is so barely in this show, but when she's there, she steals the show. The side characters are also perfectly handled. Kenny Kong is here, but he doesn't contribute much. Remember him? He's Brian Bendis' OC that's the only kid at school who could figure out Spider-Man's identity, and he also gets to date Kitty Pride, whom Bendis is obsessed with. That guy's not gonna be in the movies. There are also a lot of nice little indignities that remind you that being Spider-Man isn't all it's cracked up to be. Like Peter entering an intense chase sequence that spans the entire city and then realizing he forgot his shoes on a skyscraper. And now, the amazing Spider-Man is reduced to sneaking around for his shoes. Or burning his tongue on hot cocoa before a big fight. Yeah, tell them, present. What? <sighs> I burned my tongue, okay? Not to mention his costume being too vulnerable to the elements in wintertime, and his laborious process to earn the funds to get some long johns under that shit. Fun in the sun, not so much in the snow. These things are the things that make Spider-Man down-to-earth and relatable. Relatable doesn't mean he's a self-insert devoid of personality, it just means he deals with everyday conflicts that feel like something your average person would encounter and struggle with. Spider-Man isn't 100% just me, he's a very distinct character. However, he and I have both stressed about paying bills or have possibly torn our pants in public. Being a normal person isn't totally glamorous, sometimes it sucks. And this show does a really solid job of portraying that aspect of the character without feeling like they're going overboard and dumping on him for the sake of it. Everything to love about this series is very nuanced. Everything is calibrated perfectly, not too much or too little of anything. So much of this show's Spider-Man and Peter Parker activities are so deftly handled, but what's a hero without a villain? A braggart and a charlatan! But a major factor of this show is its villains. Much like a lot of early Batman stories that focus on the transition from realistic gangland crimes to freaks in costumes, this series uses Spidey's introduction to the city as a catalyst for the same sort of evolution. All of his more down-to-earth villains like the burglars and crime lords are presented as having been around for a long while before he got his powers, and you see that genre of criminal being phased out in favor of animal-themed high-tech or super-powered goons that throw cars at each other. Even the old-style crime boss Silvermane gets a silly transforming battle suit to keep up, which is very reminiscent of that arc in the comics where he was a severed head and a robot like Robocop. They use that for Hammerhead in the new games. All of Spectacular Spider-Man's storylines run in three-episode arcs, in a way that makes them feel like four to five issue arcs in a comic run. And these are all centralized very heavily around things he's learning at school and the education and or development of Peter Parker, as Greg Weissman put it. I find that this show follows my personal rules about the ideal way to adapt a long-running comic arc, which is to use what works and strengthen what doesn't. It's not a one-to-one -one adaptation of the Lee slash Ditko era or the Bendis and Bagley books, because barring nostalgia goggles, both have completely different problems. Now Peter isn't a weird Ayn Rand reading edgelord, but he's also not dating his adopted sister Gwen Stacy. Comic books are bad, I'm so sad every day. For one, they did use the idea that Otto Octavius was a disgruntled ex-Oscorp employee who went mad from being abused by his boss all the time, but they decided to set this up as a framing device and introduce a lot of Spidey's enemies by having them be Oscorp rejects commissioned by the local mafia to fight Spider-Man. Here the idea works because it's paced out well enough, but this idea would later irritate the shit out of me in the movies and games by having Oscorp be the top supervillain factory in the world. Sometimes you just gotta have a criminal fall into a super collider, that's fun too. Gotta be careful where you fall. And the show has its fair share of villain origins like that too, with Electro, Venom, Craven, and Mysterio being completely unrelated to Norman Osborn's shenanigans. They augment this more modern approach to Spidey villains by also including a lot of classic guys you don't see much anymore, like the Enforcers, the Tinkerer, and Silvermane. Naturally, they do little things to fit them in better into a more modern setting, but I think all of it works. Making Montana from the Enforcers become Shocker was kind of an interesting choice. I guess the reason that Oscorp being a supervillain factory in this show works is because, like, the criminals are hiring them to do that, instead of them making Dr. Octopus arms and vulture wings and rhino suits and all this dangerous shit for, like, no reason. At least there was, like, politics happening behind the scenes that explained why they were building these crazy, stupid inventions. 
Really, the only change this show made to a classic villain that I don't vibe with was fusing Craven and Puma into, like, one character. He was cool without being a silly tiger guy. This was too much. We left the crazy furry villains on Counter-Earth, guys, please. This is also the only Spider-Man adaptation to not butcher the shit out of George Stacy, so that's cool. He totally knows he's Spider-Man, sick. Maybe a man in a mask doesn't have something to hide, but something to protect. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yes, sir. Normally I'd say that high school Spidey is too early to introduce Venom, but this series gets it right by developing that arc over a while in the first season and accomplishing two things. One, Venom is still an alien, and two, Eddie Brock has legitimate beef with Peter Parker without also being irredeemable. Somehow doing both of these is very hard for a lot of adaptations. Plus, making Eddie around the same age as Peter is sensible so he's not a 35-year-old man wanting revenge on a kid. College freshman, little man. But I'm guessing you're missing me at Midtown High, huh? He's like a perfect balance between the Ultimate and 616 version of the character. Seeing this series' version of Electro made me realize something. He's probably the least developed Spider-Man villain, in terms of personality or motivation. I may piss people off by making this point, but the fact that every version of Electro in movies and cartoons is so drastically different proves to me that there really isn't, like, anything interesting in the material to adapt for him. He's either the Red Skull's son or a bullying victim that becomes a metaphor for Columbine, or a guy with a severe sci-fi medical condition that pushes him into this whole Hollow Man bit, or a socially awkward nerd that has severe abandonment issues. Remember in Web of Shadows, that whole I gotta save my sister thing, even though that was a character that was made for that game? At best, in the Ultimate cartoon in the recent game, plus Spider-Man No Way Home a little bit, they all shared this weirdly defined goal of becoming pure energy or something like that, but that's so vague and uninteresting. We have no concept of something like that because it's not real, so we can't like understand why he wants that so bad. You know, with every version of Doc Ock, the specifics of how he gets his arms and his relationship to Peter Parker are different, but he generally always has the same characterization. With Electro, it's always some random nonsense that has nothing to do with the comics because there's, like, nothing to adapt. Nearly every Spidey villain has some kind of storyline that goes in depth about them or at least a series of issues that defines a strong characterization for them. Rhino tried to quit crime and marry that nice lady he met at a diner. Shocker is like a down-on-his-luck working-class supervillain that's trying to make ends meet instead of world domination. Sandman has a pretty strong moral code and sometimes serves as an ally to Spidey and even became a reserve member of the Avengers. They tried a bunch of shit with the lizard that didn't work, but at least they made attempts. Go watch that video. And thank god this show dispenses with all of that and, like, makes him turn into the lizard once and only once and then that's it. But what does Electro have? He's, um, kind of a mutant, but not really. He's bisexual, I guess? He was once the face of an anti-establishment political movement during the 2008 financial crisis. That was weird. One time he almost blew himself up by plugging his ass into a billboard and then thanked Spidey for saving him. Maybe there's like a really good single issue Electro story in an anthology book that I missed, but I think he like, kind of sucks actually now that I think about it this way. Electro's just there to fill out Sinister Six rosters and everything. He's got nothing going on. But I'm getting sidetracked. Now this one's a bot. A bot about to... Oh, fudge. Only I didn't say fudge. I said the word. The big one. The queen mother of dirty words. What the fuck? When I said this show planned ahead, I meant it. There's a whole slew of background characters from the comics that fill out the cast, with the plan that they'd eventually become major characters in the forefront of the story. They throw that stuff in for the assholes like me that actually read all the comics, or at least all of them until the concept of Kindred made them permanently allergic to them. Look, they got Stan Carter before he became the Sin Eater, and he's voiced by Biff from Back to the Future. That voice fits him really well, actually. Oh, come on, DeWolf. Kid's just saying what everyone's thinking. Look, Sarge, when he takes the law into his own hands, he goes too far. You ask me, Spidey hasn't gone far enough. It's kind of dark that his partner is Gene DeWolf, knowing how that would end up later on. Hey, how's it going? Sorry. I'm missed. Uh, 
Let this be like a wake-up call to turn your life around. Ow. <laughs> Butthole. Ow. Uh, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. <laughs> Look, we got Cletus Cassidy over here in this institution for deranged criminals. He doesn't talk, but you know he probably murdered his grandma in this continuity too. There's Hydro Man, voiced by Bill Foggerbocky. When we're clear, I remote activate the countdown, and cascading detonations bring the building down in its own footprint. Roderick Kingsley, the guy who is actually the Hobgoblin instead of the seven other guys we thought it was? I've heard somewhere that this sleazy reporter guy is actually meant to be Mac Gargan before Jonah ruined his life. We even got Miles Warren preparing for clone shenanigans by messing with people's DNA. They were gonna do the clone saga and that blows my mind. I know people used to trash this show for its really unique art style, but I've learned to love it with time. The characters are designed by comic artist Sean Galloway in his distinctive art style, with big emotive faces and exaggerated proportions. I think considering his art from around this time, this show did a really good job of tempering it down to something more pretty in animation form. Which they also did shortly before this with those two Hellboy animated movies that shared a lot of the crew with this series. I wasn't sold on it at first either, you know, when I was 10 years old and had my dad pirate this show for me because they never actually played it. But eventually I came to an understanding with everyone's weird action figure elbow joints. It's less noticeable when they have sleeves on, but what the fuck is going on with Harry? The art style does lend itself to animation very well, however. Everyone is simplified just enough to get them in and out of some really dynamic poses really quickly. So you go from this... Oh man, I've got three science papers due Friday. I have to study all night for a big exam, and I'm still batting zero with Felicia. To this... Spidey hasn't moved like this in 2D before or since. The fight choreography in this series is only rivaled by the MTV Spidey. If there's anything I still can't quite reconcile with the look of this show, it's the very earthy, muddy color palette that felt like a lot of shows from around this time. Everything is brown and beige and dark green and really dull blues and grays that holds back the very fun character designs. I do wish this show was more colorful at times. I like that John Jameson isn't a werewolf in this show. I love that this series has memorable locations that we visit again and again. The recurring set pieces lend a really strong sense of realism, like this isn't just an infinitely large cartoon city with a billion skyscrapers. It helps all this feel so real. From Peter's life at the high school and the bugle, to the criminal underworld with recurring locations like Tombstone's auto shop and penthouse, Norman Osborn's penthouse and Oscorp, and Montana's bar that eventually is given to Russian Spike Spiegel while Shocker's in jail. Oh yeah, the voice cast! Bunch of fucking A-listers in this damn show. They got Revolver Ocelot to be Peter Man, and for many people, he's like the definitive voice for that character. John DiMaggio's range is insane because he voices two characters in one scene talking to each other, and I can't even tell. You got power no one else got. Not even Spider-Man. Revenge is for chumps. I don't care about Spider-Man. All I ever wanted was the big score. Every guy who played Spider-Man in a video game from around this time is not Spider-Man in this show, and it's pretty great. Keith David was Tombstone for one episode for some reason. I like to think that he was still Kevin Michael Richardson at this time, but he just sounds like Keith David over the phone. Like, I sound like my dad over the phone, but not in person, you know? I always wondered why that is, but I feel like if I ever asked Keith David at a convention, he wouldn't even remember this show and, like, wouldn't have a clear answer. Oh, you know, he did that same thing for Young Justice. He plays Mongol for one episode and then dips. Maybe he's just really busy. Fucking Freddy Krueger is the Vulture, and season one, Meg Griffin is Gwen Stacy, and I think this show and Emma Stone are the only reasons people under the age of 40 even like that character. And of course, Steve Bloom kills it as Green Goblin, who is the main villain of the series. Ah, but the Green Goblin doesn't take orders from insects. The Green Goblin swats them into oblivion! I also think Alan Ratchins is like the perfect Norman Osborn voice and will never be topped ever. Enough! You whine more than my son. I can't have weak men in my organization, Otto. That guy's IMDB is funny because he's barely in anything, especially not much voice work. He's one of those actor for hire types that just appears in small single episode roles in live action shows. And then randomly, he's also the best Norman Osborn voice ever. Uh, he's also the Clock King one time, to be fair. 
I love this voice cast, and I always get excited when any of them reprise their roles in other media. Although, Josh Keaton should have reprised this role in another animated series from around this same time. Yeah, we're talking about that mess. So, for those who may not know, this cartoon was intended to be part of a shared animated universe. Much like the now beloved DCAU or the 90s Marvel Animated Universe. This universe was helmed by Christopher Yost, and unlike the others listed, all of the shows in this one were on completely different networks. With Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes over here on Disney XD, and Wolverine and the X-Men on Nickelodeon, and Spectacular Spidey being all over the fucking place, I could never keep track, and that's why I had my dad pirate it. The CW under Kids WB, which was immediately consumed by four kids, and then transferred to Disney XD once the merge happened. The connections in this universe are thinner, but they're there, like Wolverine and the X-Men cartoon bumping into the Hulk, and then mentioning the animated film where they first met. Or Thor and the Enchantress carrying over their beef from the double feature into the Avengers show. In all three things, Hulk and Bruce Banner have the same voice actors and generally the same design. Which is kind of nuts because it means that Nolan North's Deadpool is technically the one canon to the spectacular Spider-Man universe. Or at least, you know, that was the intention. But Disney bought Marvel and the TV rights to Spider-Man. Not the movie rights, mind you, and that's still tenuous to this day. But they had all of Spidey's TV adventures on lockdown and some pencil pusher decided it would be easier to drop this show and start fresh with something more under Disney's management and control, rather than delegate with the crew that was already working on this. Thus, the planned crossover episode where Spectacular Spidey would have met the Avengers was redubbed at the last minute with Drake Bell to lead into the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon. This was done so last minute that they forgot to swap one of the lines and you can still hear Josh Keaton's voice come out in one scene. Is this safe? No, it's not. All of this making the Earth's Mightiest Hero Spidey a strange Schrodinger Spider-Man that is neither ultimate nor spectacular, but some twisted form that lies in between. I'm Spider-Man! What's wrong with your voice? <sighs> I have a feeling a lot more of this was Spectacular Spidey influenced earlier on. Darren Norris doesn't voice Jonah. Instead, they got J.K. Simmons to prepare for his return as Jameson in The Ultimate Show, but Darren Norris is definitely in this episode. We checked security cameras. It was pushed over by an angry mob. I bet he got recast too. And with Betty Brant, they didn't even try to recast her, so she's still Greg Griffin. He doesn't have that spider signal in the Ultimate Show, but you know where he does use it? This episode is kind of a weird epilogue to Spectacular and a backdoor pilot to Ultimate because Peter mentions he's 17 years old. Uh, I'm 17. Respect your elders, punk. His design changes could be attributed to age, but the bagliness of him seems like another way to visually prepare the audience for the new show on the horizon. I'll tell you that the Avengers crossovers being canon to Spectacular is a lot more likely than Ultimate because Luke Cage and Iron Fist completely desync it by not being teenagers. Otherwise, there's nothing in these Avengers episodes that says it can't be Spectacular Spider-Man if you care about that shit. Whatever, canon is a cruel and fickle mistress that doesn't love you. Much like Spider-Man 94, this show was the point of inspiration for a lot of the creative choices in the movies that followed it. I suspect because lazy-ass screenwriters would rather get cliff notes from a few episodes of a cartoon than actually read a bunch of comics. The guys who made the cartoon did the research for you! So, we got Scientist Gwen Stacy, Max Dillon's powers coming from electric eels, Oscorp building Rhino's suit, Montana being Shocker in Homecoming, Vulture trying to get revenge on a rich guy that wronged him when he was just a scientist. Ned Leeds' redesign as an Asian American, blindfolded Spidey beating Mysterio by just not looking at all of his holograms, and Mysterio working with Tinkerer and Chameleon, etc. I did say almost perfect, so I need to find things to complain about because everyone thinks I'm the angry negative guy, I guess. Even though the majority of my videos are about things I like in the last three years. Uh, what are some things that aren't awesome about this show? Sometimes the music choices feel really dated, like stock music from the time. And uh, other times it seems like the composer just gave up and reused some of his work from Batman Beyond. Hit the alarms! It's... Making Walter Hardy Uncle Ben's killer was dumb. He's supposed to be like a master thief, but he robbed the fight promoter in broad daylight with a witness around and no mask on. Then he jacked a car while leaving a gunshot victim. That's not stealthy. That's not classy. 
I know the idea was to create some your dad killed my dad drama between Spidey and Black Cat because that was preferable to her scrometing on his balls because he's underage or whatever, but I don't vibe with it. Hey, Spidey never does anything easy. I never asked to be Spider-Man. I never asked for these powers. We all wear masks, Spider-Man. But which one is real? My father's struggling. There's no place you can hide. A guy who can't even see when his friends are trying to help. Tonight you're in a particularly unfriendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. You just hit the jackpot. Accept the gift. The Parker rejected. We're Venom! Just once, I'd like to be early for school. Put me down! It's for your own safety, Pickle Puss. Innocent, but still at large. Guess you can't win them all. So what if nobody threw a parade? Spidey stays because Spidey's needed. Maybe a man in a mask doesn't have something to hide, but something to protect. Hey, if I wanted all the glory, I wouldn't wear a mask. If you're subscribed to this channel, you've seen every episode of this multiple times, so there's no point at all in convincing you to watch it or recommending it. So I'll just say I'm glad I rewatched it, and I plan to do so every few years instead of failing to grapple with the cold hard reality that this will never get a third season. Learn to let go, kids! You see, I'm trying to reverse jinx it because if I play the pessimist and say that this will never come back, the chances that it might increase so that everyone can come back to this video at some point and comment and say that it aged poorly. I'm an agent of chaos! I don't have some profound conclusion to make on this show that hasn't been said a million times before already. It's a show made by people who really love the character. The cast is great, the animation's really cool. Uh, it sucks that it didn't get some, get some more seasons. Clearly it had an insane amount of untapped potential. But even what little of the show that we did get was incredibly high quality stuff. And I think we have to keep appreciating it for what it did do, in addition to wondering what it didn't get to do. Who knows if it'll ever come back, but I'm happy with what we got. Plus multiple Spider-Man references, I guess. Remember that guy? My view count sure does. Alright, just so I can get him in the thumbnail. Spectacular Spider-Man is the second story-driven Spidey series following the ongoing life of lovable everyman Pietro Palmer and his ongoing battle with love triangles and also mad scientists dressed like animals sometimes. This is a good-ass cartoon. I know people love to compare Spider-Man stuff and argue about which is the best thing and who is the best actor and all this other senseless drivel, but I love this show just as much as the 1994 series despite not having much nostalgia for either. I didn't really get into this show until a few years after it was over because it never played on TV when I was awake and it was harder to hunt down DVD box sets when you're like 12 or whatever. Like Evolution, it's pretty different from its predecessor, but the changes make it unique, and I don't mind a different take on certain storylines. In this episode's sheer strength, Spidey hangs out with his friends on Christmas Eve, but becomes the target of the Sinister Six. It's not the first time he's fought them in this series, but in the time since last, they introduced both Kraven and Mysterio, so the roster could be a little bit more akin to the one from the comics. Save for Rhino, who stands in for Doc Ock because of plot reasons. Okay, third time something heavy's been dropped on an ice rink, second time it's been this particular ice rink, and third time we've seen this one. I just love how much this show gets Spidey. He's clever and cunning, funny and sarcastic, and also a little tired of everyone's shit. Plus, he's got the old Parker luck. I can't think of any superhero who has to do something as undignified as fight six supervillains at once, while speaking like Daffy Duck because he burnt his tongue on hot coffee after getting yelled at by a girl. Oh, that's probably the least painful part of my night. Loser! You're a loser! But of course, despite being beset upon by bad luck and acting like a bit of a goof, he's still a certified badass and either smashes the bad guys with his fists or outwits the ones who are too big to smash. It's a Christmas episode in the same way Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It's more so just an unrelated adventure taking place on the holiday, with the visual aesthetic of Christmas joy in the background of all the high-octane superviolence. I think this is the same mall from the X-Men episode. Maybe all these shopping malls appearing in Christmas specials could be turned into some kind of conversation about the commercialization and consumerism that have taken over the meaning of the holiday, but... I don't care. If there's anything I don't like about this show, is making Kraven into a weird lion man. I feel like maybe they were trying to combine him with that other character, Puma, since they're sort of similar. Whatever, this episode's badass. Once the action gets going, it's essentially just one long fight scene with no breaks in the middle, and Spidey's powers and quips are well utilized. 
A bit too soon to gloat, Spider-Man. Well, you are the expert on premature gloatilation. I, I can't believe he just said that. Check this one out along with every other episode of the show because it's great. And you've probably already seen it eight times if you're one of my subs, but I'll recommend it to the three new people who haven't seen it yet or are too stubborn to because they prefer the other show. Josh. Being very upfront and honest about this stuff also reminds me of that embarrassingly bad Moon Knight Christmas episode of Ultimate Spider-Man where it seemed like he wasn't actually allowed to say the name of any holiday. So he just keeps saying, <clears throat> The Holidays! Like it was auto-filled into the script for that episode. I've never spent the holidays away from her. Sorry, close for the holidays. But if you want to get in New York City a lifetime of holiday nightmares, you're definitely on the right track. I've seen some really bad holiday decorations, but those are the worst. Happy holidays, everybody. Okay, just be honest with us. We all know Spider-Man's Jewish. Come on, just say it. Fuck. <laughs> okay, I've been kicking his ass all night. Let's give Ultimate Spidey some love. This Christmas special is like in my top five episodes of this entire show. Granted, that's a low bar, and believe me, finding five really decent ones out of 104 was harder than you'd expect. This episode has a depressed and lonesome Spidey on Christmas reliving some memories of his early days as a superhero, which causes the art style to change to something really cool and classic. I feel like this is what Spider-Man freshman year will look like in motion if it ever comes out. Plus, he starts recreating 60s Spider-Man animations on his adventure, and it's one of the few times in this show that a joke actually lands. I dig it! I've sworn I swung down the street before. Over and over. <laughs> Must be deja vu. I wonder if Troy Baker playing Shocker and Montana in this episode is, like, an intentional thing because of the last one. In addition to the memories of Christmas past, Peter is also shown a glimpse of the future if he gives up being Spider-Man. He's the CEO of Parker Industries or whatever, and all other superheroes have been killed off by Norman Osborn going by the title Goblin King. He's given these visions as a form of reflection after being blamed for crime, as per usual, and being ditched by the rest of his friends on Christmas Eve. But Spidey's indomitable human spirit can never be broken despite being tested again and again. And it turns out this nightmarish glimpse into the future was all a mystical scheme being controlled by Nightmare. Mark Hamill guest stars as the Dweller of Darkness, and really helps round out this episode as one of the best in the whole series. Although again, the bar is kind of in hell. This episode is a really great Spider-Man story on its own, and it feels like it could have been a mid-2000s one-shot from the comics. Like the short Halloween, but better. Sorry, bad example. Despite his pessimism, Peter Parker will never be able to throw away his hope for a better tomorrow, and that's why we love him. <sighs> Let's just get this over with. Everyone knows Spectacular Spider-Man was a great show. It was accurate to the source material, it had a great voice cast that really fit the characters, and it told its stories with planned out long-term arcs in mind that always had a payoff or would have led to something greater. It was pretty much the complete package and Sony did a good job with it. While it was still running, the television rights to Spider-Man were returned to Marvel by Sony in September 2009 as a concession for holding on to the movie rights for... ever. But Disney purchased Marvel in December 2009, and with that deal, they actually also purchased the TV rights to Spider-Man, which meant that Sony and Marvel both no longer had the rights to keep the show going. Disney did. Ultimately, ugh, they couldn't continue it because Sony still had the rights to Spectacular, and had to start fresh with something created in-house that they could manage and work on on their own instead of having to cooperate with guys like Victor Cook and Greg Weissman that already had their own intentions for a Spidey show. This all begets a new series titled after and loosely adapting Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man comics. You can tell because of that haircut no one has anymore. It was big in the late 90s, early 2000s though. When comparing this to the comics, I think it's most fair to base that comparison on the 1610 book since that's what the Ultimate series was using for a baseline. Though I wish we got something a little bit more similar to the tone and storylines of that book because for all its faults, it's still a really interesting and likable comic. I know everyone had words for Ultimate Spider-Man when it came out, thinking it was the worst things could possibly get. They were wrong, but between the childish sense of humor that often falls flat for viewers over the age of, say, six, the lack of depth to the characters and storytelling, or the really poor voice acting from certain major characters, there's a lot of valid reasons to hate this show. And I will be talking about a lot of them. However, I think we're all too harsh on Ultimate. I mean, it's not perfect by a long shot, but it's not completely irredeemable. There's some stuff I like here. There's some things I may not agree with, but I understand them. And I do find some of its stranger quirks at least fascinating to talk about and dissect. 
Probably one of the biggest sources of frustration is that there's four times as much of this series as Spectacular, and a huge portion of that can be sort of low quality, but nonetheless, this is the longest running Spider-Man series by far. There's a lot here, but a big fear of doing this video is that it would just be 100% complaining and trashing a show that's been trashed to death already. So let's be fair to it and acknowledge its merits while also not straying away from talking about what it lacked. Here's a lukewarm defense of Ultimate Spider-Man. I guess. I don't know. I ended up really wanting it to be over the more I watched it. We could be a team! We gonna get fame, money... Don't forget the bitches. There's not going to be fame, and there's not going to be bitches. Okay, I didn't ask for any of this. I, I just want to be like everybody else. This series differs from the rest by firmly planting itself in a Marvel universe that is currently inhabited by hundreds of already established heroes and villains. Instead of Spidey keeping pretty much to himself, minus the occasional crossover, the show begins with him getting roped into a special team of upcoming teenage superheroes sponsored by S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury with the goal of improving his independent superhero gig into a government-funded and trained Ultimate Spider-Man. Because of his on-the-job superhero experience, Spidey is placed as the leader of this team and finds himself responsible for guiding and training Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Tigra, and Nova. Given that Luke Cage ends up marrying someone that was in Peter's high school class, I always figured that they weren't that far apart in age, but squarely placing Luke Cage, as well as his best bud Iron Fist, as teenagers the same age as Spider-Man? Eh, feels a little weird to me. Those two being here immediately discounts any chance of continuity with Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, so let's consider this a fresh start of an entirely new Marvel animated universe. I guess that makes this like the fourth one now? I'll start by saying I do like the look of this show. The character designs are pleasant, detailed, colorful, and distinct for this particular take without being too stylized. There's a loose attempt to pay tribute to Mark Bagley's ultimate interpretations of the characters, which is more prevalent in some characters than others. I've always thought his vision for the Spider-Man world was really cool looking and modern without betraying the classic character designs or being overly militarized. And that translated well into the visual style of this series. I think it looks even better in Season 2 when they started drawing Peter with a more square jaw and making his Spider-Man eyes even more wildly emotive and expressive. Get you a man that could go from Eric Larson to Gabriel Delato at a moment's notice. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Anyway. Actually, as the show's art style changed, I feel like he started looking mostly like John Byrne's Spider-Man later on. And you know, this show isn't lacking for solid action. When it comes down to the fight scenes, they're well choreographed and well animated. A lot of the techniques here with combining 2D characters and 3D moving backgrounds are like a massive evolution of what they really wanted to do with the 90s series. Just with new technology that can make it look really cool. It's all just integrated a little bit better than it used to be. The battles between Spidey and his villains are always exciting and fun to watch. And the fact that he's usually backed up by a whole team of other superheroes in these fights adds for some variety that other Spidey shows never really had. Save for maybe Amazing Friends, since they're usually not this heavy with crossovers. And these crossovers with other heroes are usually the best part of this show. The way Spidey interacts with every Avenger or random hero that pops in is totally different. He fanboys over Iron Man, has immense respect for Captain America, he thinks Moon Knight is a weirdo, he has a friendly rivalry with Hawkeye, he can't stand Wolverine, and he always advocates that the Hulk is a good guy that's just misunderstood. And you just know I gotta talk about the Deadpool episode. This was Deadpool's first time being allowed to directly interact with a cartoon Spider-Man, after those two other times where we got blue-balled. But, I'm very indifferent to this episode. In terms of writing a Deadpool for kids, it's fine, I guess. I like that it's adapting issue two of Deadpool's first ongoing series by Joe Kelly, one of the founders of Man of Action. I gotta wonder if he had a direct role in this episode using that influence for the plot. Never heard of you. I designed this costume myself. Black and white eyes, red suit, though you made it your own with the crossword theme. Oh wait! Webs! Those are webs! <laughs> Will Fradel could be a great Deadpool if he gave the voice a little bit more Terry McGinnis and less Ron Stoppable. You can't attack me with puns! 
Puns and bullets and pointy things. Yes, I can. I'm running the show now, and this is just the tip of the spear. Although overall, for a voice for Deadpool in this, I would have preferred Nolan North or Jason Spisak, since he was really good in the Marvel anime stuff. Go check out my video on those. All this show is sorely missing for crossovers is a proper Fantastic Four episode. We only get the thing one time. All of these team-ups we do get are pretty cool, and if this show is going to be so full of crossovers, they might as well be the best part of it. However, these developed and unique interactions, ironically, don't carry over for Spidey and the main cast of heroes that are in pretty much every episode. Despite being around nearly all the time in the first few seasons, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s superhero team team are oddly underdeveloped and lacking in any deep connection with Spidey or even each other. The team's dynamic is also never fully formed. These characters don't bounce off of each other well, or really at all. You'd expect Luke Cage and Danny Rand to be broing out all over the place, but they barely speak to each other. None of these characters really talk to each other in a scene without Spider-Man present. We as the viewer never get a sense of any relationships between them at all. The only real thing they share is constantly ganging up on Peter and treating him as an outlier. All of their interpersonal conflicts turn into him versus them, no one ever seems to side with him when there's an argument among the team, and they always act like they don't like him that much. You seen my friend Peter? Shrimpy kid? Spaghetti arms? Three dollar haircut? Only a 98 average? Nova and White Tiger in particular are especially rude to him. You ever meet someone who makes shit uncomfortable by getting way too chummy and personal way too fast with friendly insults? I'm coming! Uh, hey. oh. 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 <laughs> Tell me you got that, Nova. Totally got it, Power Man. Best friends can poke fun at each other and make snarky comments because it's earned and comes from a place of love. The team are all shitting on Spidey the second they meet him, and the level of respect and courtesy never really forms. I mean, maybe in the last episode, as like a, just like a, we gotta wrap things up, but ugh. They're always hostile or putting him in a bad spot by being selfish assholes. That's why you ditched me? So you could come home and throw a party? Um, surprise? We are not having a party. It's called Squash the Spider. Squash the Spider. Squash With friends the like these, who needs enemies? So we don't buy this bullshit, we're a family rhetoric because he never truly feels like one of them. No matter how nice he is to them, it never seems to be enough. If your family treats you like this, then just get a new one. Fuck those guys. And these characters are not strongly developed enough on their own to make up for this behavior. You don't get a sense of why they're so snotty, they're just like that and it never becomes endearing. Doing a show like this, with an emphasis on a team, you want to spotlight each character's importance to the team's dynamic, their backstory, and what makes them unique incredibly early or the viewer isn't going to care about them. But the S.H.I.E.L.D. kids don't get individual episodes to flesh them out until midway through Season 2 and these attempts to build them up are pretty laughable. The best try was with White Tiger, because now we know that she inherited her powers from her dad, who was killed by Kraven the Hunter. She's always fighting back a lot of rage. Just like your father and your grandfather before you, you use your powers of the White Tiger for good. Like you did when you took down Kraven, that White Tiger is still inside you. Yeah! Yeah! <sighs> That's all well and good, but all we really get about Luke and Iron Fist are reasons they've gotten powers and not much else in terms of personality. Spidey finds out that Luke thought his parents were killed by terrorists trying to steal their super soldier serum, but it turns out they're not and they're fine. They go save them together and that's all we get. No deeper insights into Luke's mentality as a hero or what makes him who he is, or any kind of philosophical stuff about him, it's just, it's all treated so casually and surface level. You risked your life for me when we rescued your parents! Y you didn't think! You just did! <laughs> Iron Fist is sidelined through most of his episode to focus on Spidey having a battle with Scorpion, who is a ninja and sounds like Zuko in this universe, I guess. The only thing Spidey learns about Iron Fist in this episode is that he has a lot of money he never spends. You're Danny Rand, billionaire Zen master from Kun Lun. Remember the Shao Lao? The trials we faced together? Rand is no more. And Nova. Jesus Christ, they didn't even fucking try with Nova. His entire episode is more about propping up the Guardians of the Galaxy like a big advertisement, and he's hardly there for it. 
Season 2 ends with Green Goblin mind controlling the team and turning them into goblins, and Peter attempts to get through to them by reminding them of all these events and their bond, and he has like nothing to say to Nova at all. Like the friends we are! We saved an entire galaxy, Sam! We can beat one silly goblin! Ah! Come to think of it, Nova in the show is an irredeemable, annoying piece of human garbage. Yeah, you get a job now, Parker. You don't need to kiss up to money bags anymore for cash. You gave him my costume? Sam! Wanted to see the look on your face right there. That priceless. I'm 100% certain that Sam Alexander is a pretty cool character in the comics and doesn't act anything close to this irritating on his worst day. It seems like they wanted him to be like a lovable asshole but forgot the lovable part. Every single line of dialogue out of his mouth is talking about how great he thinks he is or trying to take someone else down a peg, usually Spider-Man. There was a point where they made it seem like he was going to be written out of the show and I was so excited until it turned out to be a fake out. Bruh. Ah! Huh? <gasps> Fuck this guy, seriously. Eventually, these guys stop being front and center, so all the time wasted with them is even more frustrating. In the later half of the show, they fade into the background as Spidey starts going to S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy for training superheroes. They're not really his close circle of friends anymore, they're just kids he goes to school with among like a dozen others that kept getting added as the show went on. They pretty much just got replaced with a team of Spider-themed characters for the whole Web Warriors thing. Given the involvement of Paul Dini in this coming out around the same time as Batman the Brave and the Bold, I always assumed this was supposed to be like that, but for Spider-Man. A more lighthearted and campy show with a sense of humor that's willing to play around with the absurdity of comics and their characters. Batman is basically never Bruce Wayne in that show because he's too busy having adventures. Brave and the Bold is also entirely focused on crossovers with DC characters outside of the Batman world, and showcasing weirder and more amusing parts of comic history to kids that they wouldn't really know about. This was going for something similar. This isn't the show where Gwen Stacy dies in a PG-13 movie spinoff, or Peter visits a little girl with cancer. This is a show where Loki turns Spidey into Spider-Ham, or the team battles Awesome Android. Or they give Sandman that silly costume from the comics. <laughs> or Spider-Man goes to Boston because New Yorkers treat him like crap. Actually, on the list of recommendations for episodes of this show, I put Spider-Man on the very top. That episode is so weird and funny and irreverent. It's like the one time I think they nailed what kind of humor they were going for, because otherwise... Totally not handled. Who are you talking to? Come out! I'll go sunlight all over you! Yeah. The humor in this show drags it down immensely. Okay, okay. Turns out he's pretty cool. Live and learn, huh? <laughs> this bitch thinks he's She-Hulk. You wish, buddy. So yes, Batman the Brave and the Bold is silly and intentionally funny. This show... That just makes you pig man on campus. <laughs> <laughs> is trying to also be that, but failing miserably. Spider-Man's fourth wall breaking shtick was such a misfire and it hurts this show so much because it didn't work one time. And it's in like almost every episode. At best, it's like a Family Guy style cutaway gag that doesn't quite land. At worst, it's like if you were reading a comic book and some annoying asshole who thinks he's way funnier than he actually is walks into the room, takes it out of your hands, and then explains to you exactly what you just read. Then he hands it back to you and leaves. And then at the bottom of the next page, he comes back again. Hey, remember that visual gag in Spectacular Spider-Man where Flash Thompson agreed to be Nick Bottom in the school play? Not knowing that character gets magically turned into a literal jackass? Okay, so imagine a billion jokes like that, but without the clever parts. Boy, do I feel like a... <laughs> Little chibi tiny Spider-Man shows up and just says the most unfunny shit. This show's sense of humor is like every generic joke people say when they want to exaggerate that something is failing at comedy, but completely unironic. Awkward. <laughs> what are y'all looking at? There's something behind me, isn't there? He's right behind me, isn't he? So, 
That happened. At a certain point, I have to wonder who is this show for? Because the writing is so aggressive about holding your hand and over explaining to you everything that's happening. It makes me wonder if this was meant to be aimed at way younger kids. Spider-Man is either pausing the scene to deliver clumsy exposition directly to the viewer in case they missed a previous episode, or sometimes just explaining to you what you just saw five seconds ago as if you like you're a small child that didn't quite get it. <laughs> this monkey sound effect is to this show as the whip crack is to Johnny Test. God damn. <laughs> Sorry. What if I just put that into other Spider-Man shit? Look over the side, hero. We have a surprise for you. I'm not sure why so few of the writers can make the fourth wall humor actually convey useful information, or at the very least a little more amusing than like a light chuckle every eighth joke. I don't think Disney wanted this show to fail, they got a lot of talent in the writer's room. Paul Dini, co-creator of Batman the Animated Series, was a consultant and writer on this. Man of Action, the creative team that made Ben 10 and Generator X, both solid shows, were there too. Brian Michael Bendis, love him or hate him, had some compelling stories about Spidey in the short term, so having him pen a few episodes wasn't necessarily doomed to fail. Plus, he wrote some of the best stuff in the 2003 show, so why not? And yet, we get an adaptation of the Ultimate Comics arc where Spider-Man and Wolverine switch brains, and he still made it a point to have Wolverine flirt with a 15-year-old Mary Jane. Baby, I do like me a redhead. Ew! Why? Why keep that? Dumbass. So much of the writing in this show is really weak. Characters aren't developed at all, plots don't really go anywhere, and sometimes I swear it feels like characters are just saying dialogue for the sake of saying dialogue. Even if the thing they said doesn't really make any sense in context of what's happening or what was said just a second ago. What's wrong? Aren't you going to run away? Yeah, cool story, bro. That wasn't a story, Amadeus. He asked you a question. How can he be so happy? I'm never that happy. And I'm Spider-Man. Whips or jokes? Where's your sense of humor, Peter? He made a joke like 10 seconds ago. What the hell are you talking about, Norman? And who's coming to hit me again? Maybe on a script level, these lines might work, like if you're reading it and the voice director is just asleep at the wheel and letting them read the lines in a way that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Hey, new recording session. I don't have a throat infection anymore, so now my voice sounds okay. This show never grew on me per se, but I did start to enjoy watching it more in the later seasons because the most annoying parts became less prevalent and more interesting side characters started to take center stage like Miles and Scarlet Spider. I don't think Ultimate Spider-Man ever really found its footing, but later on it got closer at least. While the hero struggles characters for various reasons, I am fascinated by what this show does with a lot of its villains. Some of the long-running story arcs of the show give special attention to Norman Osborn becoming an ultimate and 616 goblin hybrid, Doc Ock repeatedly leading the Sinister Six, and both of them using Venom as a sort of bioweapon. Much like the actual Ultimate Universe, the symbiote isn't an alien, but a synthetic creature created in a lab. This time by Otto instead of Peter and Eddie's dads. Venom isn't really a character in this universe so much as it is a plot device. There's no Eddie Brock, so Harry Osborn is the original villainous host for the symbiote, and I don't really like that direction. Yes, father. I want to prove myself. I rid the world of you! Hearing Venom refer to Green Goblin as father bothers me. I don't like those characters being so tight at the hip. They're both unique antagonists on their own. Carnage appears in Season 2, but is basically just Venom again, but slightly upgraded, and the host is Peter. Harkening back to the PS2 game, shoehorning him in because a Venom Carnage boss fight was pretty cool. I have a score to settle. Because we have a score to settle. Kinda giving me mixed signals, Venom. 
Then they bring Carnage back in Season 4, and he's totally different, and they act like it's his first time ever showing up again. There's no Cletus Cassidy because, uh, it's hard to have a Disney animated show with a serial killer. At least his voice and design are better the second time around. More chaos! <laughs> Eventually, Venom finds a new host in Season 3 with Flash Thompson, and I don't really love that either because it's too early. Flash needs a lot of growth and humbling before that works. This is a show for children, so they can't show him losing his legs in Unspecified The War. And I suspect they only included him in this show because A, it was current in the books at the time, and B, because the show was retitled The Web Warriors, and I think they wanted more spider-themed characters for the new toy line that assuredly resulted. I guess it's alright though, because no Spider-Man show is ever, ever, ever going to last long enough to fully adapt all the Flash Thompson stuff accurately, so it's either shove Agent Venom in too early, or he'll just never appear in any animated form at all. 20 years later and Morbius still can't drink blood in these shows. I can now drain the life energy from any being. Norman Osborn is played more sympathetically this time around than the previous show, and I like that choice. Him being the goblin is a change that's forced upon him by Doc Ock and not something he personally desired. But when he's cured of goblinism, he's actually a pretty alright guy and makes legitimate attempts to help Peter or become a superhero himself as Iron Patriot. And it's not all a big trick like in Dark Reign, he's actually doing the right thing. I also love how Electro is voiced by former Spidey Christopher Daniel Barnes. Once again, Electro in the comics has no personality, so they can just do whatever with him. In this universe, he's the only villain that actually enjoys Spidey's banter and finds his jokes pretty funny. Always have your team in attendance. Anyone have a pencil so I can scribble that one down? <laughs> the pencil. How many Sinister Sixers does it take to change a light bulb? Six! Four to hold down Electro and one to screw the light bulb into his mouth. If you guys want to see that, it actually does work. <sighs> Maybe later. Sort of a cross-generational Spidey supporting Spidey thing. Also, for everyone that commented on the last episode and said that Electro is interesting because he was a normal working class guy before his villain days, and he's like Peter if he was given great powers but wasn't responsible with it, you know, that applies to like 40 other characters in these comics too, right? Try harder. I want you to dig deep. Prove me wrong. Give me a real legitimate reason to think Electro doesn't totally suck compared to every other villain in Spider-Man. Please, like, try hard. <laughs> and speaking of those other villains, they kind of get the shaft in this show. Rhino is a mutated teenager at Peter's school trying to get back at Flash Thompson, and the episode is like a big anti-bullying message, but... Not nearly as impactful or dark as that other show. Eventually, he's recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. to help Spider-Man, so he just stops being a villain. Vulture is a teenage goth kid with amnesia and sort of like a fusion of Vulture and Carrion of all characters. The fact that he looks so much like this show's version of Otto Octavius and has the same voice actor, Tom Kenny, really made me think that they were going to reveal he was some kind of Doc Ock clone at some point, but that never happened, so he just looks and sounds like Doc Ock for no reason. Scorpion is a rival ninja from Kun Lun that hates Iron Fist. Get over Mysterio made a deal with Dormammu to create actual magic instead of illusions, but he ends up reforming to take care of his teenage daughter. All of these are very strange and feel like change is made just for the sake of being different, not for doing something more interesting with the characters. And I suspect some of these wildly alternate takes were mandated by Disney as a way to differentiate this series from Spectacular Spider-Man, since these came out so close together. I could never find a source to fact check this, but I read online once at some point in the last decade that this show's mission statement was not to retread the same ground as Spectacular. Which is why there's no Eddie Brock, no real Peter Parker home life drama, and why so many of the villains are heavily remixed. Like, you got this show that was really good and comic accurate and was a hit with fans and critics alike, and will be remembered and loved forever for its really brilliant stamp on the character, and now you have to do the exact opposite of what that did. Which, if you think about it, sort of set them up for failure? I've never been able to find a source to corroborate this, but I think it would explain a lot of things about this show that never really gelled with Spidey fans. It's a multiversal constant that Flash Thompson will wear this costume at some point and be mistaken for the real Spider-Man by a villain. I hope to see this trend continue. It's really awesome.
You may be wondering, in the wake of Spectacular Spider-Man making an interesting and well-developed character out of everyone Peter went to school with, how does Ultimate Spider-Man handle his massive cast of side characters? Uh, unfortunately, extremely poorly. Everyone has one personality trait. Mary Jane wants to be a reporter because they keep making her Lois Lane. Ugh. We know nothing else about her and she's basically irrelevant to this entire series. You could cut her out entirely and it wouldn't change a thing. They gave her the Carnage symbiote and made her Spider-Woman in the last season so that character had something to do after not appearing for like... 30 straight episodes, but even that episode is more about Scarlet Spider than her, so it wasn't necessary. She just doesn't do anything important in the entire cartoon. And her and Peter are also strictly friends and never actually attempt any sort of relationship. This Spider-Man is bitchless by choice. They didn't even want to try to write any kind of romance plot because it would be too clumsy and difficult. This Spider-Man is Arrow Ace, I guess. Peter and Flash's bully and victim to friends arc is clumsy, rushed, and doesn't hit as hard as the prior version, but an attempt was made at the very least. But much like MJ, it seems like the writers were constantly shoving Harry into new costumes and personas because they didn't know what else to do with him, so he's Black Suit Spider-Man, Venom, the Patrioteer instead of American Son, and Anti-Venom in this show, none of which were really all that interesting at all which is why it kept changing so often. If they found something that worked, it would have stuck, but he's just... Ugh. It seems like the writers of this show were afraid to tackle any kind of character drama that resembled real life, so it was easier to just slap stupid random superpowers on everyone and call it a day. It gets very repetitive that everyone Peter goes to high school with ends up becoming a superhero at some point. This show's Aunt May is decent at least, and this is the first animated version of her to learn Peter's secret. So it's kind of cool to see her being like an active parent to a superhero. The Peter Parker element of this show goes out the window for long stretches. You can go multiple full episodes back to back without him taking his mask off at all. He starts living at the S.H.I.E.L.D. facility full time and has no school career, social life, or job. They don't explain why Aunt May doesn't even notice him leaving the house and living somewhere else. The duality of Spider-Man is a real non-entity for most of this show. Ultimate Spider-Man also has some very repetitive storytelling choices that unintentionally highlight the other biggest issue with this show. Several times. Several. They do a Freaky Friday body swap story where Spider-Man and another major Marvel character switch minds. Or switch bodies. Whatever. You put your mind in Spider-Man's body? That's Brilliant! Oh, I'm going to write that down. And in these moments, we hear really talented voice actors like Steve Bloom, Fred Tattashore, and Troy Baker all technically play Peter Parker in someone else's body. We switched bodies? We switched entire bodies? What did you do? What freaky things you do to me that I'm in your hairy beast buddy? Oh, come on! My brain is in the Hulk's body? This cannot be happening again! Oh, my life is ruined! Finally, if anyone could tell I'm not the real Loki, it'd be you, right? <laughs> cool! Loki doesn't fly? I thought Loki flew. I've gotta get to him somehow. While Drake Bell plays... Eh... Attempts to play these other characters. You lost him. You don't lose him. He's a tracker, like me. He's on your trail, you dumb kid. No, I'm telling you, I totally... It's me, fool. I promised you Spider-Man's body, here it is. Don't worry, New York. There's more where that came from. <laughs> no! Hulk don't like this. Hulk like purple. Oh man, they really hate the Hulk. And I thought they hated me. Leave Hulk body alone! Hearing this juxtaposition of the way more experienced veteran voice actors against Bell's feigned and half-hearted attempts to be these other guys paints a giant arrow pointing at the ultimate Spider-Man's most glaring design flaw. Ah! I hope I don't miss. One, it would hurt. A lot. Go! Drake Bell isn't a very good voice actor. Like, at all. Is it weird that your voice is like claws on a chalkboard? I mean, sure, I loved him and Drake and Josh growing up. I think he'd be hard-pressed to find an American in their early 20s that doesn't have a very fond memory of that show. But 
Acting in a TV sitcom is extremely different from voice acting. Drake's delivery is pretty much always the same, exaggerated high projection for a studio audience, not very believable but you still buy it anyway because the fake sets and high key lighting waiting for the laugh track sort of acting. And it just doesn't work here. I know it was a Nickelodeon show, but it's still basically Disney Channel acting. He can very rarely deliver any believable intensity. How's your Aunt May, Peter? She seems like a nice woman. Leave her alone! <laughs> Stay away from her! You hear me, you monster? <laughs> Die, monster! His lion reads remind me of someone doing a comical, over-enthusiastic Sonic the Hedgehog impression where the punchline is the voice itself and not anything they said in the voice. Before this, his only voice acting credits were extras in Rugrats episodes or the Nutty Professor animated movie. What do you girls care to dance? What? Yeah, what? On second thought, sit down, Chunky. You're not my type. Uh, yeah, let's give this guy the lead in our animated series with 104 episodes. He was teen guy number three and all grown up, so, you know, big talent. We have scripts with generally grating and unfunny jokes as read by a voice actor that can't really make any of it sound natural or believable, and it just kind of makes Spider-Man immensely annoying instead of charismatic or likable. Like, you just kind of want him to shut the hell up already. The villains should be feeling that about him, not me, the audience. I should be thinking he's funny. What if I told you that this is myself? That every day I work so hard to be disciplined A student Ava and resist my true instincts? Well, I'm done. Stunt casting major roles in the series with untrained voices that were in tween sitcoms at the time, you say? Why not throw two more on that pile? White Tiger's voice had one credit on IMDb before this. Nova's VA also has the same credit. Who the hell even heard of this I'm in the band show? I never watched it, was it any good? Are these two good in that show at least? Please, for the love of God, hire voice actors to voice act. Woohoo! There are already so many Josh Keatons, Ben Diskins, James Arnold Taylors, Robbie Damons, and Yuri Lowenthal's all lined up to be Spidey in this. The decision to go with Drake Bell is so baffling to me. Because clearly he didn't win the role with his talent. Was there hopes that the tweens would recognize his name from that other show and get excited? Are you sure you're not confusing two completely different target audiences as one and the same? And to make matters worse, they have their very own Spider-Verse event where we get to hear several voice actors take on the same role. And you just wish the show had been about one of them this whole time. Except for not Mayday Spider-Girl, she stinks. Christopher Daniel Barnes is killing it though. Back, lest I be forced to hurt thee. By Merlin, either thou art training to be my squire, or thou art the town fool. In every universe, Peter Parker stands for heroism and responsibility. Except for one. <laughs> no. Hell is Blood Spider and even Spider Ham Ben Diskin is killing it. May I? Scientific curiosity. If I could create my own sunlight, I could eliminate the vampire's reign once and for all with this. What are you doing here? Looking for a bathroom. What do you think I'm doing here? I'm here to help. Now hurry up. Ben Diskin honestly would have been a great pick to voice Spider-Man in this whole show. He's in the same sort of vocal ballpark they were aiming for, but with way more talent and experience. And oh man, I'd kill for a Spider-Man 2099 cartoon or anything with this voice actor again. It's just so obvious and distracting who's played by an actual voice actor and who is just... A sitcom star they pulled into the booth to lazily read lines while looking at their phones and waiting for an easy paycheck. Even in the episodes where they have him singing, he doesn't sound that good. I will save you all by crawling up your wall. I'm Spider-Man. I Spider-Am. I am Spider-Man. How is that even possible? Is he singing not as well on purpose so it doesn't seem like Peter has a really great singing voice? I... I'm giving him too much credit. I just don't think he cared that much. And it doesn't get better after 104 episodes. His quality of voice acting stays the same the entire way through. Anything fun always ends with something exploding. Too late, Spider-Man. Weed has been legalized. What? How come Spidey never mentioned to Spider-Ham that he was also a pig once in an earlier season? 
Oh, because these episodes were written by totally different people and there was no coordination in the writer's room at all. Why has Spider-Man made it a personal mission to fight every member of the cast of Wings? Regardless, this show's two Spider-Verse arcs are... Some of the highlights for heavily featuring Christopher Daniel Barnes in multiple roles and doing some really decent Miles and Peter stuff. I feel like some elements of these episodes ended up being inspiration for the Spider-Verse movie, like that alternate universe goblin design. The fact that Donald Glover got to play Miles Morales and Aaron Davis before anyone else is really cool to me, considering he was the inspiration for this storyline in the first place. Your city belongs to the Grand Master. No! This can't be how it ends! If this were any other Spider-Man show, the whole thing would have ended right here. This is the only one that didn't get cancelled on a cliffhanger. After four seasons, every character acts almost exactly the same as they did in season one except Flash Thompson. Somehow he's the only character that had any development that mattered or affected anything. And even then, him discovering Peter's identity is brushed off so quickly. Puny Parker, did... What? Yeah, but... No, did... No, 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 that's impossible! This wasn't the game changer I was expecting. What, did you not feel like trying? I would have made that a bigger deal than one line of dialogue and then instant acceptance for the whole rest of the show. Ugh. Nearing the end of this series, I was starting to get exhausted with it, but kept hanging on because I at least like Agent Venom, Miles Morales, and Scarlet Spider. It's kind of an issue when those three are more exciting to watch than the actual Ultimate Spider-Man. Fuck changing Miles' name to Kid Arachnid, though. That was just disrespectful. You can't both be Spider-Man? Kid Arachnid? That's not... Not bad, actually. Do I look like a Kid Arachnid to you? I guess so. I don't care if it's confusing, just call him Spider-Man, fuck. I went into this show and this review really wanting to defend it and assure you that it's overhated, but... Watching the entire thing back to back really showed me that a lot of the complaints back in the day were totally valid. Despite the strong animation, aesthetics, character designs, and some mildly interesting alterations to the Spider-Man mythos, I can't say overall that I actually like this show. All these nice things are so heavily overshadowed by its flaws, and I can't say I'd ever find myself wanting to re-watch it after this review. I don't think I'd ever just like casually turn it on and relive it. The writing is surface level, the characters are flat, the humor is completely irritating, and every interesting idea is muddled by the above. I don't hate it, but it doesn't hold a ton of value in my eyes, and I can't really muster the strength to say it's underrated or any of that shit. I think maybe we overreacted and hated it too much, but every complaint about it was pretty much on the money too. That's why I said this defense was really lukewarm, where it's like, yeah, you guys are right, but... I don't know. I don't hate it that much. There's stuff that's cool. I like Scott Porter. I can't think of much that this show did that had a lasting influence on the character or the fans in the same way its predecessors did. Other Spidey cartoons were used as the blueprint for multiple whole movies, introduced ideas that were cool enough to pull into the books, or are just so fascinating that they're being talked about decades after they ended. Ultimate Spider-Man was perhaps a trial run for the MCU Spider-Man by having him so heavily connected with other Marvel characters and even meeting MCU-specific characters, like these three assholes from the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But even that end result was so extremely different from this, and I feel like the MCU Spidey ended up taking more from Spectacular. And frankly, I just never see or hear anyone talk about this show anymore. It's the longest running Marvel cartoon ever by a wide margin, and yet it just seems like it came and went and that was it. Maybe a few ideas from it weirdly ended up in the Insomniac games, but like, I feel like no one even really noticed that. After four seasons of 104 episodes, the show was cancelled and very swiftly rebooted. I assume in no small part due to Drake Bell getting a DUI, the first in a long stream of very questionable actions from the singer, and Disney probably felt it better for their brand to start over once again without his name attached. Which is fine, because after four seasons, it had run its course. If you don't get anywhere after 104 episodes, you're really not going to get anywhere after that. Ultimate Spider-Man struggled in a lot of ways, but it had untapped potential and opportunities to improve slightly that it never fully grasped. 
It'll never have the same lasting impact and high regard of these other shows because it went for quantity over quality and always held itself back from more interesting things with its characters. It just goes to show that a series that took the easy route at every turn really didn't end up challenging its audience in any way that made them care. It lacked a lot to be desired, but you know, it could always be worse. You have a cut on your lip. Uh, my crack pipe broke. You have a scratch on your neck. Yes, I met a girl on Craigslist. And you have a bruise on your neck. I met a guy on Craigslist. With Across the Spider-Verse releasing soon and the trend of multiverse crossovers showing no signs of stopping soon, Fourth Snake, Diego Rivera, Panels to Pixels, and yours truly are delving into the history of Spider-Verse and showing you the ups and downs of the concept. Even though I didn't love the Ultimate Spider-Man animated series, I did make sure to point out that its attempts at adapting the Spider-Verse concept were some of my favorite episodes of the show. It always felt like Ultimate excelled more at crossovers and less on developing its main cast members. So you can bet a whole four episode arc devoted to nothing but crossovers is where its strengths really shine. In the first episode of the arc, Spidey finds out that Green Goblin is planning to steal the DNA of the other Spider-Man variants in the multiverse for nefarious purposes. Possibly clones. Hopefully not. He forcefully turns Electro into a power source and goes on his way with our hero in tow to... well fail at stopping him like six consecutive times like an idiot. But there's no story if he's too competent, so we gotta let it slide like slide. I like the show Spider-Verse more than a lot of the comic versions because it keeps a tight grasp on Peter being the main character and the focus of the adventure. I always felt like the comic events started to include too many characters at once and collapse under the weight because there was like too many spider people to keep track of in one image. Plus, it's really straightforward that Spidey is going from universe to universe and meeting one variant at a time instead of walking into a room with like 90 of them and most of them are in the same outfit. Over the arc, he goes to two universes per episode and sometimes the art style will change drastically. Sometimes it's pretty subtle. Hi fella, according to protocol, this is the part where we are supposed to fight. But that seems inane, predictable, and a waste of resources. So, let's not just say we did. Just hang on and keep low. And don't worry, I've been doing this a little longer than you. First up is a cool 3D art style in the futuristic world of 2099. I do love the look of this 3D art style here, but the actual animation is a bit clunky. Sometimes the moves don't translate well between shots. Like I'm not understanding the poses here, and this just feels a little stiff. Don't get me wrong, I would love more 3D Spider-Man animation, I just wish it looked as fluid as the keyframes in that 2003 show. The models were lower quality, but the movement was buttery smooth and slick as hell. It seems like the Spider-Verse movie is the best of both of these by having a cool cell shaded 3D style and smooth animation movements. Across all of these segments, there's a recurring theme of the Prime Spidey helping his counterparts get a confidence boost and find their way back to the light if they're in the process of quitting the superhero biz. All of these crossovers are too short to develop the characters too well, but they succeed at getting the point across in the time available. So we start to see Spidey inspiring Miguel to keep up the good work and carrying on his legacy and uh... I'm tired, I don't want to record this right now. Are you dissing the threads? Oh, come on, this is classic! Red and blue! He says the traditional costume is red and blue as if what Miguel is wearing is not also red and blue, and this will forever haunt me. You know, Venom meets Miguel in the comics and says his costume is ripped off from his. Also, Flipside assumes Spider-Man and Venom fused into a single entity because of the color scheme. Uh, uh, okay, we can all agree that it factually is a black and red costume, regardless of your opinion on if that's better or worse than it being blue. I don't like talking about this all the time, but you keep bringing it up and I feel obligated to respond. While we're at it, Storm's 90s costume is silver, not white. The second half of this episode is unfortunately the worst one in the arc. Instead of using Mayday, they create a spider girl that's just a gender swapped version of Peter in a universe where every person is the opposite gender. And the costume. A boy pretending to be Spidey? Now I've seen everything. Boys can't be Spider Girl. You'll just hurt yourself. I'll hurt. What? 
Well, her voice acting is pretty crap, so I can believe she's a variant of this chuckle fuck, alright. The only confusing part is that she's incredibly sexist towards Peter for being a boy. And it's weird because I genuinely couldn't see him acting like that to her if the roles were reversed and she ended up on his world instead. Maybe it was meant to echo Mayday meeting Peter via time travel and him being a bit of a chauvinistic dumbass, but this take on Peter just, like, isn't like that. He's a lot of annoying, irritating, punchable things, but a meninist is thankfully not one of them. I'll give them points for their alternate world's Green Goblin being a more traditional one with gadgets and a costume instead of the green skin mutated version from the Ultimate Comics. Hey, this is a pumpkin bombs. There's not a single pumpkin bomb anywhere else in this whole show. Next episode! The noir crossover is decent, with Peter teaching that Spidey to be less of a loner and allow his cast of side characters back into his life again. Though they don't do much with the art style other than making it black and white. The episode gets more colorful and creative when he meets Spider-Ham. I dig the exaggerated toony look of this world and the more slapstick physics. They even got a few references to the other superheroes in the Spider-Ham world correct, like Iron Mouse and Captain America. Though they goofed on Spider-Ham's costume and his origin of being a spider bitten by a radioactive pig. I think that's infinitely funnier and I'm glad the movie got that right. In my initial video of this series, I complained that Ultimate Spidey never mentioned that he was a pig once too to Ham. But it turns out he does and I just missed that line somehow. I've even walked a mile in your hooves that time Loki turned me into a pig. Uh, what? It's fucking, it's 125 episodes to keep track of. It's okay though, because it spurred a lot of comments to correct me and boosted video engagement. So I've elected to get something minor incorrect in every video to help the channel grow. Next up is Spider Knight in Medieval Deadland, voiced by former Spider-Man voice actor Josh Keaton. Other than the novelty of the returning Spidey voice actor from a previous cartoon, there's not much to say here. I guess Medieval Doc Ock is kind of cool. The big selling point of this episode is actually the latter half when Brooklyn Spider-Man shows up. I'm just gonna start calling him Brooklyn Spider-Man to shut up you dorks inhaling pure copium thinking he's not Spider-Man too. And I'll double down on this too. Calling him Kid Arachnid is stupid and if you prefer that then you're stupid too and you should eat your own hands for sustenance. So I can't see you type such tomfoolery anymore. You can't post the same irritating bad opinion over and over with two hook hands. You fuck. This segment with Brooklyn Spidey is where I felt like the Spider-Verse movie started taking notes the most. It's just more streamlined than the way adult Peter met Miles in the Spider-Men book. Though some moments from that did make it into the movie too, more or less. Some shots and story beats from this and the following Spider-Verse episodes seem to get folded into the Spider-Verse movie pretty perfectly. Thus solidifying my opinion that these episodes are some of the best the show had to offer. Like that dragon Green Goblin design, both Spider-Men meeting at Peter's grave and a lot of the lessons Miles learns from Peter. You may not have been able to save the other Peter Parker, but today, you saved me. But it's okay to be afraid. As long as you- As long as I don't let fear get in the way of doing what's right. I'll try to be the best Peter Parker Spider-Man I can be. You don't have to be Peter Parker to be Spider-Man. Miles Morales is just fine. I've gone on record as thinking Brooklyn Spider-Man's initial run was pretty underwhelming with its lackadaisical characterization, but this episode sees him start to find his place as a character a little more. And the Insomniac games pushed him a little further with some fresh ideas, and then the movie came along and knocked it out of the park. It's like a game of telephone where after adapting it enough times they finally made Miles super cool and interesting to me after all the bendicisms were shaken off. Then the comics got good too. God, I wish Peter's books were doing as well as Miles. Fuck. Hey, you want to hear something cool? All right, take off your headphones and turn up the volume. It's okay, I'll wait. <laughs> All right, you got it? All right, okay. Xbox off, Alexa off, PlayStation off, Siri shut down, Cortana off. Okay, Google, how to remove genital warts. Four-parter comes to a close when Goblin and Spidey make it home to their original universe. We learn Goblin's master plan was to use the spider DNA to give himself a massive power boost at the cost of turning into a giant gross tarantula thing. Plus, he figures out Peter's secret identity from all the obvious clues that this brainlet has left along the way. Wait a minute. Peter Porker sounds kind of like... Hmm... It was Peter Palmer all along! 
After some lackluster voice acting from our lead, he calls in the cast of other guys voiced by actual voice actors that have talent, plus Spider-Girl. We get a semi-decent final fight with Electro where the characters get to play off each other well and act as a team, and it's, it's pretty nice. As far as adaptations of comic arcs go in this show, it really doesn't have anything to do with the comic Spider-Verse, which is funny because apparently this same version of him appeared there too. He even ended the comic by hinting at his own Spider-Verse in the future, which implies that happened before this arc in the show, but the show itself doesn't acknowledge it. Much like how Insomniac Spider-Man will never mention Spider-Geddon. It was just an adjacent universe! It's not the same Ultimate Spider-Man from the cartoon, it's like another universe that was created 12 inches to the left. It's like how Spider-Man Unlimited can be killed by Morlin and show up in Spider-Geddon and the new movie. There's an unlimited number of Drake Bell Spider-Mans all telling the same terrible jokes across the multiverse. Maybe even one voiced by a better VA? But we'll save that one for tomorrow. With characters like Injustice Superman and the Batman Who Laughs recently gaining popularity and then losing it a month later by being in too many things all at once, I always wondered what it would be like for more Marvel characters to go bad in an alternate universe. We got Ultimate Reed Richards putting on a Bionicle helmet and being a creepy weirdo, but not really an equivalent Justice Lords or Crime Syndicate. That's why I think it's really cool that the second Spider-Verse arc in Ultimate Spider-Man opted to do something we don't see often and create an evil Peter Parker. Now the rules within this show's first few seasons is that everyone's a terrible person except Peter, and Peter's a nice guy but he's insufferable, annoying, and unfunny. But those god-awful adaptations of their comic counterparts were later replaced with more Spider-themed team members, including a universe-displaced Brooklyn Spider-Man. After having him be a regular on the show for a while, a multiverse incursion begins due to the artifact that brought him to this universe, the Siege Perilous, being shattered. So, it's actually, it's pretty much just using the setup from Shattered Dimensions. And some of the visuals as well. Kinda neat that the cartoon is taking cues from the game for once instead of the other way around. So the two Spider-Men are off on a multiversal scavenger hunt to find all the pieces of the MacGuffin before anyone else can. The first weird universe they drop into is a Victorian London version of New York that's infested with vampires. Instead of being a loser supervillain who can't compress his web shooters small enough to fit in a watch and then gets killed by Venom, Blood Spider is this world's Peter Parker turned vampire hunter. I always thought Ben Diskin should get another chance at voicing Spider-Man after Ultimate Alliance 2, so this is cool to see. And he was Spider-Ham in these too. I also think having the king of the vampires in this universe be the lizard of all characters is a really fun comic booky choice. It's not obvious like having it just be Dracula or some Blade adjacent character. Plus, the character conflicts are more interesting here than the first Spider-Verse arc because Blood Spider wants to steal the Magic MacGuffin to finally kill all vampires, and Mr. No-Killing except when it's Wolverine and you're mad is like, nah, and has to come up with a non-lethal way to cure the vampires. Then we get a teaser at the villain Wolf Spider. It's overall a nice start to this arc, and doing one universe for the whole episode lets the plot have way more room to breathe. However, the next episode goes back to that 2-in-1 format, and they're both a lot more simple. These aren't any universes based directly on any comics, it's just PIRATE SPIDER-MAN and COWBOY SPIDER-MAN! Which isn't all that creative, all things considered, but I do like this weird dysfunctional crew of Webbeard, Howard the Duck, and the Guardians of the Galaxy-themed pirate ship. And the cowboy world has Uncle Ben survive and be some kind of superheroic badass in Carter Slade's outfit and his nephew learns the great responsibility lesson. So that's like a best case scenario. Usually universes where Uncle Ben lives lead to Peter growing up to be an irresponsible jerk. So this one's a happy accident. Part three is a lot stronger in my book when they go back to the noir dimension for one full episode. I think pulling in the Hulk for this world is a really clever idea because Joe Fixit fits right in with these characters and it's a great excuse for him to be gray instead of green. Plus you got Hammerhead and Mr. Negative as the villain, so it's a good time. I really like this one, though I'm not sure about making the black and white universe in color at the end. Sort of messes up their aesthetic, no? What, are you gonna go up to the cartoon universe again and turn everyone into normal animals? Leave them alone! The grayscale is the natural order of things here, you colorist bastards! I mean, colorist is in like the comic art thing, not as like a racial thing. 
Wolf Spider only gets a tiny part in this one to keep him in mind, but he doesn't really appear at all in part two. I think they could have tried harder to make that one tie-in plot-wise, or at least thematically with the other three episodes, since it really just feels like a filler adventure. Part four is where Peter and Miles go to the Brooklyn Spider-Man home dimension, and we get even more small elements that would go on to inspire the Spider-Verse movie, including both Spider-Men being saved by Spider-Gwen! In this show, she's a non-superpowered human that gets spider powers from her costume, which is... Uh... I don't know, take it or leave it. But look, it's the Spider Cave, and it's managed by the Aunt May of the dead Peter Parker in Miles' home dimension. I also think this show partially inspired Insomniac's take on Miles by having his father die at some point and his mom supporting his superhero career as a single parent. After all the teasing, we finally get to meet Wolf Spider and learn what his plan is. He's going to turn himself into the toughest spider in the multiverse by draining the life force of all the others. Kind of like that The Amazing Spider guy from the Hulk, Deadpool, and Spidey crossover in the comics. Except that guy was trying to use the extra spider powers he stole to be a hero. <laughs> Gwen stole that guy's name because she's really hard to market to the mainstream. I guess that's what you get when your character is basically like three inside jokes wrapped in one. Oh wait, no, that's Gwenpool. My world had a Miles Morales too, and your life will end as his did, in pain and misery by my hand! Wolf Spider is just an irredeemable evil scumbag, and it's pretty refreshing. Also, I love that Wolf Spider is voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes to give this some ties back to Spider Wars. That voice! He sounds like me! Even that shows Evil Spider-Man wanted some redemption. The only other completely evil Peter Parker I can think of is that cannibalistic super strong one from the universe where Punisher accidentally turned everyone into flesh-eating savages. But I think Wolf Spider has a cooler design and more staying power if they ever wanted to use him again. Plus, he's better at getting his Manny Petty appointments than the Zombie Lord guy. I can't say the climax makes a ton of sense. Wolf Spider absorbs all of the spiders, and then Peter just allows himself to get got too, but thankfully is brought into this metaphorical astral plane thing to rally the other spider people to just, like, escape. It's one of those willpower things, but I guess Pete's just lucky that it worked instead of your life force being absorbed and it all just goes dark or puts you in some kind of solo hellscape with no access to the other guys. On the off chance that there's some kind of afterlife when your soul is ripped out of your body via magic, I'll just rally everyone else's ghosts like in Finding Nemo to swim down to defeat the villain. Long gone are the days where Spider-Man outsmarts the bad guy in a clever way that exploits their strength against them. Now he just uses the power of friendship or whatever. You train the power of heroes. What's... What's happening to me? Was someone as evil as you? You poisoned yourself by taking our life forces. You drank too much good guy juice and it made your bad guy tummy hurt. Wait, that sounds weird. The day is saved. And Miles makes a conscious decision to move into the other universe with his mom instead of getting put there by an omniscient god thing and then having really ambiguous memory of that for the next 10 years. Ultimate Spider-Man's two Spider-Verse events are some of the very first adaptations of the comic arc, and they came out almost right after the book itself. Being as close in release as they are, the two of them seem to be companion pieces when looked at for future adaptations. Because he's so central to the interpersonal conflicts in the original story arc, where he and Peter are arguing for the position of the Spider-Verse leader, I'd have liked to see Superior Spider-Man in either of these arcs. But his cartoon debut wouldn't be until... Um, well anyway, seeing as how these two arcs inspired a fair amount of story choices in the cinematic Spider-Verse, I'd hope that Wolf Spider could catch on in another medium too, since we don't have like a recurring villain version of Peter Parker. Though for the moment it seems like the movies and comics will stick to pre-established villains from Spidey history for the multiversal events. If he does appear again though, he needs a better haircut. Uh oh. Yeah, we're doing this. Let's just get it over with. Disney's Marvel Spider-Man 2017 has the worst title for a Spider-Man cartoon ever because it's so hard to distinguish which one you're talking about without just putting the year on it. It's a show with no intro. It's a show where the Green Goblin looks like this. It's a show that's so unbothered by any sense of continuity that it simultaneously exists in the same universe as the rest of these Marvel shows and Ultimate Spider-Man. Somehow. We'll get into that. It's weird. And it's a show that is pretty universally hated by people on the internet for merely existing. 
I've been pretty neutral about it over the years because I simply hadn't watched more than one episode of it. I saw it, was unimpressed, and then didn't check back on it for like six years. But since I've reviewed every other Spidey cartoon, I feel obligated to finally talk about it because I hate to leave the job 90% finished and then quit. So these are my thoughts as someone who didn't watch this show as it was coming out, but found it years after it was already finished and over with. Did it deserve the hate? Is it really that bad? Stick around and find out! After Ultimate Spider-Man broke 100 episodes and started to slow down because of waning interest and possibly a DUI from the lead actor, Disney quickly shoved this show into production to air within a year of Ultimate's cancellation. At first, the marketing material and concept art made it really seem like this would be a cool new look for Spidey. It had that MCU influence, which was understandable with Homecoming releasing that same year, but it also had such vibrant colors and such a cool look. Then the show came out and looked nothing like that. Instead of using the Ultimate comics as inspiration for some of its character designs and stories, this series looked to the recent, at the time, mainline comics to include new additions to Spidey lore like Max Modell, a school that was based on Horizon Labs, an arc based on Spider Island and Superior Spider-Man, and the addition of Miles Morales to give him an amazing friend, rather than a team of mean-spirited assholes that he liked for no reason. It didn't quite have the same limitations as Ultimate did with what it could and couldn't do. We were finally allowed to have more classic Spidey stuff too, like a proper black suit Spider-Man to Eddie Brock Venom pipeline, or a tech-based Green Goblin. But the execution of all of these things was lacking and left fans, old and young, pretty cold on this show. It made it to more episodes than spectacular, but it still didn't have the staying power that Ultimate did. Now everyone dunks on this show as the black sheep of Spidey cartoons, considering it's the weakest in a pretty strong lineage dating back to the 1960s. Firstly, now that it's over, the sense of hatred is harder to obtain because it's come and gone. I wasn't actively following it and being perplexed by its weirder choices like I was with Ultimate Spider-Man. I just heard bits and pieces or saw my friends posting clips to laugh at on Twitter early on. I must admit, the first 10 episodes are the worst slog, but once you get through that, it becomes a lot more watchable. I can't tell if the show started to find its footing once Miles joined up or if I just became desensitized to its weirdness, but it stopped being painful to watch. At the very least, his shoulders haven't been tampered with. Take points off for that belt though. Ah, oh, the season 3 costume, never mind. Ugh, and those gloves. Yeah, its animation is obviously extremely low budget for a show like this. Everyone likes to talk about the lack of shading, the basic and undetailed backgrounds, but for me the biggest offender on the visual front is the color palette. I've never seen a show this aggressively dull looking except for the Guardians of the Galaxy cartoon that this crossed over with. Look at this scene during the daytime. Why? But that had more detailed backgrounds. Spectacular Spider-Man's colors tended to get very muddy and brown, but this is a whole new level. It's so gray and unexciting to look at. At least Ultimate Spider-Man, for all its faults in writing, had strong animation and pretty decent fight scenes. It had great character designs and a clear art direction that didn't feel limited by money. It had the sauce visually. These character designs are so blocky and low effort. It's trying to use the MCU aesthetic of panel lines and layers of fabric, but with no shading or variation in colors, it's just random lines on a completely flat looking costume. Captain America looks so naked without the letter that stands for France. Let's play Greg Land's least favorite game. Name that face. Without hearing their voice or seeing their outfit, you need to be able to identify these characters by name in under 10 seconds. And one for the ladies. Can play this game with spectacular Spider-Man, that's for sure. On the exceedingly rare occasion that the backgrounds have some texture and the characters have some lighting applied to them, it doesn't look too bad. Kind of reminds me of the new Superman show. But those situations don't happen nearly often enough to break up the monotony. I'll give it credit for some occasionally decent animation on the fight choreography, but the biggest hurdle of getting into this series above all others was the visuals being so plain and bland. The second biggest hurdle is the dialogue. So that just happened. I think the overall plots are actually fine, sometimes even outright good. 
but these are conveyed with really shoddy scripts. This is a Spider-Man that says, according to my calculations, and carry the one, out loud in conversations to sound more smart. If I want to propel it out of harm's way against an average wind speed of 12 miles per hour, the trajectory should be a little busy at the moment. Carry the one, can it, got it. Okay, I understand the scientist aspect of Spider-Man can get underutilized by certain adaptations, but this is the clumsiest and most blunt way to handle it. He has to remind you with the most awkward techno babble every chance that he can get, to the point he sounds like a bad fanfiction version of Donatello from Ninja Turtles instead of Spider-Man. Even the great power, great responsibility dialogue is presented like a chemistry formula, and it just feels a bit forced. But I also kind of appreciate the sincerity they come at it with. The science jargon slows down around Season 2, but never quite goes away. Both Marvel's and Ultimate Spider-Man break my cardinal rule of writing Spider-Man quip dialogue. Spider-Man should be annoying and unfunny to the bad guys, not the audience. I've noticed a lot of writers fail at writing these quips by resorting to Spidey rambling a sort of meta self-examination of the quips and saying shit like, Wow, I just said a cat pun and you're a cat! Or, that joke sounded better in my head, LMAO. That's impossible. It's not impossible. It's cat... Uh, cat... Can't think of a good cat pun right now. I was positive I'd run into you someday. <laughs> I just made that one up. Uh, science jokes are hilarious, don't you think? Well, I, I can't think of anything quippy. Oh, I thought of a quip... Ah, oh, too late. Now why would you want this, Mr. Purse Snatcher? It seriously doesn't match your look. <laughs> Banter. That's something Spider-Man taught me. And once he starts referencing the fact that he's making jokes, they stop being jokes and are just discussions about jokes. Once Spider-Man has verbally said, Heh, get it? You have failed to write his quips and need to start over completely. Oh, looks like I have to clip your wings! Job. So this is your secret slide out. <laughs> Get it? I can come up with names like that all day. This place is a hive of criminal science. <laughs> Get it? Hive? Oh, oh, no one's ever around for the good ones. You gotta stop asking people if they get things. But then how do I know if they got it? They'll laugh. If you explain something humorous, it's not humorous. But Xavier, these shows are for children, and it could probably make an eight-year-old laugh. Yeah, it'd make an eight-year-old laugh if I shoved your head into an elephant's ass and duct taped around your neck and made a vacuum seal. Shut the hell up, symmetrical double trunk human centifant. Is this bit too juvenile and unfunny for you? Well, the target audience for that joke is the 8 to 12 demographic, and I wrote it to sell toys, so it's above all criticism. Do you hear how you sound? Being for kids is not an excuse for things to be lazy. <laughs> Let's address this since it was the most common response when I was talking about Ultimate Spider-Man, and it applies here too. It would move me to tears if I still had tears to shed. Just because it's aimed at kids doesn't mean it needs to be mindless, unfunny noise that treats the audience like they're stupid. The best media for kids is the stuff that treats them with dignity and respects them enough to know that they can handle more mature themes if it's presented in the right way, and tries to open their minds to the worlds around them. You can have children's media with deep, likable characters, character arcs with growth and development, well-written comedy, mature concepts. When you're homeless, people look right through you. It's like you're not even there. Yeah, I've been guilty of that. Unique art design, complex stories. You're going to kill me so that Superman can't. Well, Justice League's reputation will survive my actions, and Superman's legacy will remain intact. Interesting plan. Moral dilemmas, important life lessons, and real-world issues that are happening right outside your window. The plague has people frightened. They're looking for someone to blame. We're an easy target. Only scientific inquiry can overcome the hysteria that's gripping the country. Or at the very least, interesting and well-thought-out world-building in creative settings. It's the best feeling when you can return to that same media as an adult and still find it enjoyable or even appreciate it from a totally new perspective now that you're older and viewing it from a different lens than you did as a child. As a kid, I used to watch you with my father. The great ghost was my hero. So it wasn't all for nothing. 
you're re-experiencing it as a whole new person now. So it's like learning to love it all over again for the qualities it had that made it timeless. In the blink of an eye. In the end, what matters isn't how long we've lived, but how fully we've lived. The good we've done, the friends we've made, the love we shared along the way. Until we meet again, old friend. Not every show needs to be like that, bro. What, you mean good? Well, no, but I expect them to at least try. And you know, the MCU and Star Wars are meant for children, but we talk about those with deadly levels of importance because they're live action instead of animated. Storytelling isn't given a free pass to be low effort depending on its target audience. I hold these more recent shows to much higher standards than the older ones because a precedent has been set that these shows can and should be better. If you know these series can have all these things, then why shouldn't they? You're settling for less. Kids aren't stupid and have no standards, they deserve good shows too. You can't just wave off any legitimate criticism with that. Plus, I was 13 when Ultimate Spider-Man came out. I was in the target demographic. It's not like I'm a 40-year-old man talking about why Blue's Clues is a poorly written mystery plot. That being said, this series doesn't piss me off nearly as bad. But it also gets none of the same lame excuses and apologists as the one it replaced. It's so hated across the board. Probably because it's not quite old enough yet to be considered nostalgic for the people who think every single piece of media they consumed when they were five years old is a masterpiece. Once everyone who watched this show as a toddler turns like 16, we're going to see a major switch up and a strong insistence that it was secretly underrated and the best Spidey show of all time. Ultimate Spider-Man feels like 104 episodes of someone smugly jingling keys in your face expecting you to laugh and clap your hands. Marvel Spider-Man is at the very least trying. It's not really succeeding, but I feel more sincerity from this show. I don't feel like I'm being talked down to by this one. Real talk though, Miles has all the best jokes in the show. No one's coming after me. New Spider, I have come for you. <laughs> Looks like that spider bite gave me great comic timing. Oh, I can't. I have a date later. A date? You? <laughs> Kidding. I'm never doing anything. Unlike its predecessor, this show has a great voice cast going for it. We got the same Miles as the PS4 game, so he sounds good. I like the tradition of having previous Spidey voice actors playing a villain in the new show. Oh, come on! Nothing? Really? You know how long it took to perfect that entrance? <sighs> Showmanship's a dying art form. And Josh Keaton's Norman Osborn works surprisingly well. I am the general of this battalion, Otto. Not you! You are a mere doctor and take orders from me! Now get my son to safety! We also have all-time greats on the cast like Jason Spisick, Fred Tatashore, Greg Griffin, Ben Diskin, my boy Yuri, John DiMaggio, and you know what? You're all wrong about Robbie Damon. I'm putting my foot down. Robbie Damon is a great Spidey voice. I know it seems like he's done some bad stuff. But people thought that about me too. It's not about what other people have said about me. It's about what I do. All I'm saying is that I saw proof that he's not a complete bad guy. That was enough for me. Though my evidence for this is the Marvel anime Disc Wars and Future Avengers. He was fantastic in both of those. Yes, his performance isn't stellar in this show, but not many others are either. Even though they're all great VAs. This show just chooses the strangest takes to use. I think it came down to messy voice direction because I know these guys are better than this in other shows and games, but often deliver flat sounding performances in this series in particular. If Jim Cummings isn't blowing you away, then it has to be the direction. Even still, this is a really strong cast for these characters, so I'd never say the voice acting was a big drawback on this show, even if they do sound a little weird at times. <laughs> The Jackal is Professor Raymond Warren? <laughs> they changed Jackal's first name in this because this is the first thing he and Miles Morales have been in at the same time. Props for this being the only Spidey cartoon to use slide, that's appreciated. Alright, I've heard it before, but it was a massive shock to just see how weird and unsatisfying the choices for the villains were. Yes, a considerable percentage of Spider-Man villains are mad scientists. Like, almost all of them. But they're not also the same age as him. So much of the show revolves around Horizon High and multiple other gifted science schools that every major character is a student or a teacher at one of these. And this has a really unfortunate effect of making Peter feel spectacularly 
unspecial in his own show. While you're at it, crush the wristband of Herman's gauntlet! That's where he houses the power source! Thanks, fellas! Every character is a wunderkind. I took the revised designs you emailed me, realigned the coils, and look! Every 15-year-old is a scientific genius. I've been working on a retinal identification app. And not in unique ways where they all have specific fields of science they excel in. I want you to meet the neurocortex's new home. I call it the living brain. May I interest you in a tasty beverage? Everyone seems exactly as smart as everyone else in any given scenario. I've isolated the mutation in your bloodstream. So Rhino, Miles Morales, Gwen Stacy, and Corazon are all students at Horizon High. The Venom symbiote is being studied for a student project at the school. Sandman has a teenage scientist daughter that copied his powers. Together with his money and my knowledge of science, we found a way to charge my particles so that I could live. I'll be a better sand person! Electro is a teenage scientist that built a super suit. The sweet, sweet bounty cash I'm gonna get from turning you in is gonna fund the completion of this awesome Electro suit I invented. Hobie's teenage brother, a young scientist, built his Prowler gear. It's my brother, the one who designs all my tech. At least we got Hobie as Prowler one last time before no adaptation ever does that again. Maybe in Spider-Verse 3, he'll like become the new Prowler and give up on being Spider-Man as like a wink and nod thing. I don't know, I don't think so. Dr. Connors works at Horizon. Doc Ock is a 19-year-old teacher at Horizon High. Jackal, Spencer Smythe, and Vulture are teachers at Norman Osborn's rival science school where Harry Osborn attends after getting kicked out of Horizon. Harry builds all of the goblin tech himself. Steel Spider and John Jameson are students at the Osborn Academy. These science schools are so central in all the plots that Horizon decides to make Spider-Man their official mascot because he's basically always on the campus stopping some run amok experiment or another. He's not so much New York superhero in this show as he is just Horizon High superhero. There's enough spare gear down here. I think I could rig up some gamma detectors. Help me find components. I've recreated the cure using the synthesized blood and what was left of my serum. Now we can mass produce it without any fear of side effects. The mainframe is working to isolate any foreign enzymes in Alexi's blood. I'll check the DNA sequencing. Send me those figures. This genetic strain will require its own anti-diffuser. Check out this security robot I made. Yo, something isn't right. Ah! Ooh, looks like I get to show off my new scrambler. It can cut the power to anything mechanical. And so every character in the side cast can whip up a chemical formula or a special machine in no time at all to help Spidey beat the villains. In fact, a lot of the time they end up just doing that stuff for him while he's floundering around helplessly and can't beat the villain on his own. Spider-Man, hang on! Oh, love that piece of tech! Thanks. Stand back, Spider-Man! We use parts of the carnival games to create a coagulation gun! Peter is constantly being in your face about how much he loves science, yet is somehow the least useful scientist in the show. But that creates a problem where, you know, when every character has the same expertise, the same level of intelligence, and the same career desires, a lot of them feel like pretty much the same character. Nothing really distinguishes Miles from Gwen, or either of them from Peter or Anya. I guess Anya is like, just more angry? And this is only worsened when all three of them get the same powers as Peter. So Peter isn't special for being a science genius, and he's definitely not special for being a spidery superhero guy. Wait! Huh? Oh. Miles, where are you? <laughs> Miles! Miles? Yes, no! Spider-Man. <laughs> he's sedated. Stop shouting his name, you dumb asshole! Tumahimaka, putanginamo! Ten episodes in and Miles becomes the second Spider-Man. This show cuts out the middleman and has Miles, Gwen, and Anya get powers likely within a year of Peter, so really the only thing he has over them is a few additional months of experience. But they catch up to him so quickly that him being the first Spider-Person doesn't matter soon enough. They never really give Miles a superhero name either, which is irritating. What? I'm not Spider-Man, I'm a totally different guy. It's just Spider-Man and the guy who is here too. And that's just, that's just giving more fuel to the most annoying fucking people on the internet. The Disney Plus subtitles call him Kid Arachnid and Spy D, but neither of those are said in the show itself. 
the mentor and protege dynamic just can't work in this world, so they don't even bother with it. We're all equals! Except Miles and any other spider friends won't show up for multiple episodes in a row, so Peter can still have solo adventures. Which just kind of begs the question some of the time, why aren't they helping? This show manages to also get Spider-Girl and Spider-Gwen in there by having them be two of the millions of New Yorkers to get copies of Peter's powers in the form of a virus during the Spider Island arc. Gwen runs around without a mask, and Spider-Gwen is just a name she gets from fans after being seen rolling with Spidey on the news. I'm not so sure why she became so noteworthy considering a few hours after that, everyone else got the same powers, but they were trying to work in Spider-Gwen as a reasonable in-universe name. I feel like this character will never have the same upward momentum as Miles simply because they can't come up with a satisfying name for her. She's always going to be associated with a completely different character that's been famously dead for half a century. They still eventually steal Ghost Spider's name for her though, which seems frivolous since she was just wearing the same costume and puts on a mask now. Like, people know it's you, you can't walk it back. I don't know, it just... I don't think the writers even really thought about it or cared about it. I really wish it could just be Peter and Miles. Anya as the third one, at the most, would be okay, but four spider people is really pushing it. At the very least, it's not as intrusive as the spider team in Ultimate. They don't overstay their welcome by being in every single episode. After the initial awkward meandering of the first ten episodes, the show starts to find its groove with storylines. It's got a bit of that traditional bad guy of the week stuff in there, but it's also got really lengthy serialized stories adapting recent comic arcs from Dan Slott's run on the character. Spider Island arc is kind of fun, I don't know, I liked it. I like seeing New Yorkers paying tribute to Spidey and helping him out, and it was a fun excuse to get some no-costume brawls for Peter since he could just pretend to be infected like everyone else. It was always cool seeing him in the Ultimate comics getting caught up in a fight at a time where he couldn't put his costume on. So you just see this tiny 15 year old using his Herculean strength to smash giant monsters half to death. And this is the only animated series to throw a bit of that in there. At the very least, this show has a marginally better Venom than the Ultimate Spider-Man show did. And does a legitimate attempt at Eddie's rivalry with Peter at the Bugle. No Harry Venom, thank God. Though Eddie's not a particularly fleshed out character before getting the suit. It all happens pretty fast, and much like the comics, his motivation for hating Peter is murky, and works better if you just assume the symbiote is the driving force behind it. Nobody is doing it like 90s, Spider-Man! I don't know what I'm gonna do, Anna. I had no idea it was so expensive. The tuition bill. I knew it. And job listings? No, oh, Aunt May. This stops here. I won't let you take an extra job just so that I can stay at Horizon. This is unfortunately the worst version of this scene, but it's still good that they included it. I like how Peter gets a job at the Bugle because he can't keep paying his tuition at Horizon. Classes start Monday, and if I can't get Spidey footage to sell to the Daily Bugle, I can't afford tuition. This is uncomfortable, but I'm sure you know why I called you here. I'll have my tuition money in soon, I promise. I just need a couple more days. Unfortunately, I don't know how long I can keep your spot open here if we don't get a payment. It's something brought up in multiple episodes until he reluctantly settles on selling unflattering videos of Spider-Man getting his butt handed to him so he can stay at the school. But this arc ends when Eddie loses the suit and doesn't come back for the rest of the show, which is a giant bummer. They dedicated so much time to Doc Ock and Harry Osborn, but Eddie gets shafted so quickly and it just feels like a giant missed opportunity. Especially since the last season is so Venom-centric, it just feels weird that Eddie is not there at all or even really talked about. The show is doing that thing where Venom is the suit and not the combination of it and someone else, so the host becomes irrelevant as the series goes on. Venom is just the goo. Doesn't matter who's inside, I guess. Which, I don't like. There's also a 13 episode long arc about Peter being overwhelmed with so many supervillains and his homework that he doesn't sleep at all and is just completely exhausted by the end. And that leads into six more episodes of a Superior Spider-Man adaptation that's Actually, not that bad. Help! Spider-Man! Help! Just passed him by? No way he did that! Unlike the comic, it didn't overstay its welcome and it didn't last too long. and It didn't rely on all of Peter's closest friends being totally oblivious idiots. The whole arc is about Miles knowing it's not Peter right away and trying to restore the original Spidey's mind. He's the one who gets the Avengers to run tests on Otto and just won't let it go. 
he's basically the one that gets Peter in position to return to his body. Though it still gives Otto that moment of self-sacrifice realizing he's not Spider-Man. I wish the comics had Miles and Peter this tight. They only talk to each other like once a year in passing, which sucks. I might actually like this version of Superior better than the book just because of the way Brooklyn Spidey is utilized as such a key figure. That's fun and cool. I like when he's important. Then we get the rather disappointing Goblin War arc with no... well, no Goblin. Not the correct one. The weirdest part of this show is that Norman Osborn never officially becomes Green Goblin. Harry becomes Hobgoblin and serves as a recurring ally for Spidey. Norman steals his suit one time and then fake dies, then later becomes a symbiote-infused Dark Goblin because Dan Slott storylines. The Green Goblin in this show is actually the Vulture, which... Ugh, which is whatever, don't care for it, but it does end on a very nice redemption arc for Doc Ock that ties the whole season together in a nice bow. I thought it was kind of ballsy to actually just kill him off. And they commit to it, he's gone. Season 3 is cut short at 12 episodes, which just screams that this show was cancelled abruptly, but they do throw in a time-tested classic invasion of the symbiote storyline. I like that they use the Gwenum design. Feels like a missed opportunity to not have Harry's Hobgoblin suit styled like Demo Goblin, though. Oh, and they got J.M. Dematis on some of it? Dematis? No wonder this episode has a better script than all the others. It's like the only time May has some character development in the whole show, and Spidey isn't constantly being cringy, and a Moon Knight crossover on top of it? Very Web of Shadows, I dig that. They also toss in a few symbiote characters that never really show up in adaptations like Scream, Mania, and Scorn, though they're just space monsters for the purposes of the plot, which is a little disappointing. The final episode uses a bit of inspiration from Donny Cates' Venom too, but not nearly as developed. This show has a real problem of throwing characters in there for the sake of just saying they had them, but not developing them at all or having them actually act like themselves, just, hey, we got Mania, kind of. Not Andy Benton, just, like, the idea of Mania? She's like Sonic, but a symbiote. Cause, you know, her fucking head can only exist in a 2D drawing and it would look weird in 3D. There's a better overall attempt here at actual Peter Parker personal life-centric storylines than Ultimate. He can't pay for school and he has money problems, his personal relationships are suffering as a result of superhero stuff, you know that good stuff. But both shows are burdened by the recent problem with Spidey media. They don't know how to write a cast of characters without giving them all superpowers to keep them relevant. I think if they could get away with it, Marvel would give Aunt May superpowers and throw her in a costume so they don't need to write things like, oh, she's dealing with the health issues that one faces in the twilight years of their life and the financial difficulties resulting from such, or, oh, she's depressed because her husband died in a home invasion. They'd rather just put her in a big stupid robot suit and have her punching people. I mean, fuck, Mary Jane is like Ben 10 in the comics right now. Even Liz Allen in this show is Screwball, a young red-haired YouTuber who can't get people to watch her show unless she centers the videos on Spider-Man all the damn time. I appreciate the relatability of that. You'll never be her, though! There's also the weird matter of this show's placement in a shared Marvel animated Marvel Universe. So Ultimate Spider-Man and Avengers Assemble both had a backdoor pilot for Guardians of the Galaxy but their voices and designs in their final show looked a lot more like the movie counterparts once it started in 2015. Fair enough, we can excuse the change. But then it ran alongside Ultimate and Avengers Assemble. Avengers Assemble had multiple guest appearances by Ultimate Spider-Man, and those versions of them appear in his show. Okay, not for nothing, but I come from a team of heroes and Nova, who are all teenagers, so I know a thing or three about infighting. He's doing cutaways, talking about working for S.H.I.E.L.D. and does the oh-so-hilarious monkey sound effect. That's him. That's Ultimate Spider-Man. A connection is established. The Spider-Man of this universe is the Drake Bell one. But then Avengers Assemble has a Season 5 episode where Robbie Damon Spidey shows up instead. Then the Guardians of the Galaxy series crosses over with his show. So somehow both Spider-Men and both Guardians are canon to Avengers Assemble at the same time? What was going on over there? That's like if Andrew Garfield showed up in the first Avengers as planned, then we didn't see him for four years, then Civil War happened with Tom Holland and all the Avengers just pretended to not notice. 
The only answer I've really been given for how this works is that season five of Avengers Assemble just takes place in another universe from the first four seasons, which is stupid. And also season one of Avengers Assemble has flashbacks to Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and that's supposed to be in the universe with Spectacular Spider-Man, so it's just a disaster. The only host for Carnage in this universe is Thanos, oddly enough. For the Guardians of the Galaxy episode, Peter is rendered in an art style closer to Ultimate Spider-Man, so he's more tall and muscular. It's just weird seeing this design look so much more manly. His costume, the mask especially, looks almost exactly like Ultimate Spider-Man, just with sleeves and a segmented belt. They also use the comic black suit and Venom design instead of the ones from this series. But Max Modell shows up and he's completely on model of the main show's art style. There's a really strange lack of cohesive art design and continuity around all of these shows. It just wasn't as tightly planned as the 90s MAU, the DCAU, the Yostiverse, or, or even the actual MCU movies. Which show was canon to which, which designs were used, it was all over the place, they didn't really care. Maybe they just didn't think it mattered, and I guess it doesn't if we're being honest, but that shared universe stuff can be really fun to engage with when it's handled well, and it's odd to see an attempt at one that's so haphazardly done, especially under Marvel's banner. <coughs> a weird thing about doing Peter's origin in a heavily pre-established Marvel universe instead of early on is that he's now in the same age bracket as all of the legacy characters that ended up in the Champions, like Ironheart, Amadeus, Hulk, and Miss Marvel. There's even a vague hint at him having a crush on Miss Marvel, and I guess I wouldn't be totally opposed to these versions of the characters dating, but given the age difference between their comic counterparts, I see why it wasn't pursued. Unlike No Bitches Mick Vagina Repellent over here, and shockingly every other Spidey cartoon, this guy actually ends up with Mary Jane at the end. No cliffhangers or abandoned storylines or nothing. Good for you, dork. Oh wait, they never resolved the fact that Miles' dad off-screen was transformed into a sentient swarm of bees bent on murdering his son. Oh well. When I started watching Ultimate Spider-Man, I went into it wanting to like it and defend it, but ended up not enjoying major portions of it. This show is the opposite. I went in expecting to hate it and found that it wasn't as unpleasant a marathon as I prepared for. But my overall opinion of both shows in the end, despite their shortcomings, is the same, which is... Eh, it's fine. It's watchable. I mostly didn't want to kill myself by the end of it. Well, not because of the show, anyway. Neither of them are as good as the shows preceding them. Even at its worst, I can't hate this show. There's plenty of things wrong with it, and I absolutely see why people don't vibe with it. I certainly don't love it or anything. It doesn't get a rise out of me at all. It's just, like, fine most of the time. When stuff about it sucks, it's thankfully kind of inoffensive, I guess. I think I'm just so detached from it compared to Ultimate Spider-Man, where I was watching that one in bits and pieces as it came out and didn't like it as a kid, and can still be kind of harsh on it now. But seeing this show for the first time over the course of, like, the last month before this video drops, it's hard for me to feel strongly about it either way. Maybe it's just because I'm looking at it with the eyes of an adult instead of a kid this time. It's not an underrated, overlooked, hidden gem, but it's not a complete flaming disaster that makes me angry whenever I think about it. That's reserved for Pacific Rim Uprising, the worst movie ever made by humans. Marvel Spider-Man has a lot going against it, but I think in spite of it all, it's perfectly serviceable. It just doesn't excel at anything. It's just another Spider-Man show. Relatively unspecial and not as significant as its peers. But then, I guess it goes to a school for really gifted Spidey shows. It's hard to stand out when the competition is that fierce. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, Finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years! Not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So, maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If everyone who watched this video donated one dollar a month, I'd be able to afford a house for myself, so that would be, that would be really cool. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic, or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. 
And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator code XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time.